Well, hello everyone, and uh, we're here for the, the last, the main event of uh, Evola Day, if you want, the live stream. I'm joined by Panama Hat. Say hello, Hat. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I, I speak to you in a state of uh, physical unwellness, but uh, the, the show must go on, so here I am. Sorry for the strange voice. Your spirit is overcoming your kind of bodily... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Faustian spirit. The spirit has overcome the flesh. And uh, I'm also joined by uh, Frody, who you may know from Guide to Culture. Yes, hello, and thank you for inviting me. I have to say that uh, it's been many years since I read most of Evola's books, but this sounded, like, this sounded like too much fun, so I couldn't say no. So I'll try to keep up with you guys. But I reread a few things in the last few days. Great. No, yeah, just before we get going, it's, um, there's been a lot of great stuff uh, on Evola Day today. Um, I just, uh, you know, I've, I've, I rewatched it. Obviously I knew what was coming, but, um, I watched everything so far today. Um, and, uh, Charlemagne made a fantastic video on his channel. Uh, Prudentialist made a great video on Evola on war. Um, I thought John Morgan was a great, uh, guest on the interview. And, uh, just now we had Kat. I watched a little bit myself as well. Yeah, I watched um, I watched uh, most of the interview with John Morgan. I thought that was excellent. I haven't seen the rest, but uh, yeah, I think I think we'll have a good conversation as well. Yeah. So um, on this stream, we're going to try to tie everything together by going through uh, Evola's uh, life and works. Um, he had a pretty long career. He wrote a lot, lots of stuff. Um, if people get get going, by the way, I um I was recently trying to find a good copy of uh, Guide to Culture, the Ezra, Ezra Pound book, Frody. I don't know if you have a, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you have a. Maybe I'll ask you later, but um, uh, I, I'm just reminded, uh, what's a good edition of Guide to Culture? Of the Ezra Pound book, well, I think it's yeah, yeah. Uh, it's available in a in a in a version and an edition that is in print, uh, and that's the only one I have. I don't have an old one from the 30s or anything like that. Right. Okay. All right. So, uh, Evola was born 1898. Was it? Uh, yes, he was born in 1898. Uh, but just before that, though, I've I've made I've made a note on this line that. He actually had an elder brother, um, Giuseppe Gaspare Dinamo Evola. Sorry for my terrible Italian pronunciation, by the way, who was born in 1895. Now, that is important because he will figure up quite prominently later on, uh, post World War II. Uh, but like yes, his brother. So, yes, and he had an, an elder brother. Um, but yes, uh, Julius Evola was born Giulio Cesare Andrea Evola in Rome to Vincenzo and Concetta Evola. Um, who were both from, uh, I think it's pronounced, is it Chin Chinizi? Sinizi? Uh, who in, in Palermo, in, um, sorry, you know, the, uh, Sicily? Palermo. Sicily, that's right, sorry. It's Sicily, <clears throat> right, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, all right, so he was born in 1898. Um, yeah. One of the things I, because I, I watched the, I, you know, obviously I read through, path of cinnabar but i also rewatched that interview you know that he did in french and, it, and in both places he basically says um i don't want to talk about my background i basically killed it myself so yeah. uh, what do we actually know about his background um about his childhood we know literally nothing um it we we know there's there's no biographical information that's come forward obviously anybody that would have known him as a child is long dead um so it's not like we can go and have a have a search for it. Um, the earliest information we have on him is that um, he writes about himself that he studied technical and mathematic topics as a young man throughout his uh, his school. And at some point during this process, he became um, he developed a spontaneous interest in thought and art, and became kind of obsessed with the decadent. Uh, writers like Oscar Wilde and Gabriel D'Annunzio. Um, and of course, this, this is important because those were works of literature driven primarily not by narrative, but by pure aesthetics. And um, they have a kind of will to transcendence, if you like, purely based on that 
that fact. You know, they like when you when you when you when you read one of uh, their poems, particularly the latter. Um, uh, it's it's kind of like a a, a, a a call to something higher just in of itself. Um, the, the, these are not bourgeois works of works of literature, I don't think. Um, and then this basically leads on to um, a fascination with all contemporary art and all contemporary literature that young Evola can get his hands on. And he says that he spends literally days at a time in the library um, as a young man. So, you know, it's peak, uh, peak, peak autism here. Um, and what happens is during that time, during all this reading, he discovers Nietzsche. And this is a kind of early turning point because Nietzsche, of course, rejects Christianity. And prior to this point, Evola had grown up in a very Catholic area in a very Catholic household. And um, of course, this this critique of Christianity was so powerful that Evola basically, you know, took took it entirely. Um, and from that point on, he basically found Catholic doctrine as it is to be inauth inauthentic. But he did recognize it as a positive force in the sense that it could guide people back to tradition. Um, and he, some, some, something interesting is that he actually re rejects the idea of the Ubermensch as Nietzsche puts it forward. You would think that somebody like Evola, you know, who is famed for his love of uh, aristocraticism and elitism and all this sort of thing and caste would, would be a, would be a, a proponent of that theory, but he's, he's not. Um, he rejects it because he simply finds it too, um ignorant of being he says um and it it has a kind of uh, a roughness to it a kind of pl plebeian he, he basically thinks the ubermensch is too plebeian uh does evola um and uh instead of following on with nietzsche he turns to a little known jewish philosopher called uh, carlo mickelstatter who committed suicide at 23 after publishing only a few works but he wrote this um this 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 pamphlet basically who talked and it, this pamphlet mentions that um one should become internally autarkic and solely self-sufficient on oneself and this is um this is one of the things that was brought up in the uh the, the, the key concepts uh video from earlier um this this idea that that a being should depend on nothing but itself that you shouldn't be reliant on outside help and and other yeah. other other beings do. I, I have to make a confession here as well because I did my top ten influences, and I um I I originally had this uh, this chap in, but mm -hmm. I I decided to leave him out because I was not convinced in the end that he was a top ten influence despite uh, despite what Evola says. Um, really? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. But well, anyway, let, let's. Uh, I, I actually on. think he was quite a uh, a big influence in some sense because he has th this book that he wrote, uh, Persuasion and Rhetoric, mm -hmm. uh, or Rhetoric and Persuasion. I, I forget <laughs> which order it is, but it is really um, about that you have to be sort of a self-contained uh, individual in order to not be sort of influenced by undue um, outer mm -hmm. influences. Uh, and that that seems to be some sort of uh, that, an ideal that Ebola st strives for as well. But of course, he might not be in the you know top influences. But I do think that there was uh, there are some oh, ideas oh, yeah. I mean, that you can recognize uh, from Michael Stade. Yeah, no, with, with, without doubt. Um, the, and Ebola tried to stay true to that principle. I think throughout his throughout his career. Yes. Um, I just thought it was a bit like when when all was said and done if i weighed it against um if i wait when i weighed it against everything else i i just you know maybe he would have been number 11 or something so, but i did oh, yeah. i strongly considered they putting him in but i, I left him out in the end pa yeah. part of the reason that he was quite keen on the works of that philosopher is because he was actually friends with mickle status um cousin who i believe was an artist who also committed suicide at a very young age um so it seems to sort of run in the family a bit there um but i mean i i would say that mickelstadt is a, a very big influence just for that reason as you mentioned that you know this this idea that he learns as a young man carries through you know to his to his death yeah uh, can we can we just very quickly go back to his parents a second uh -huh. um because we mentioned his brother one of the things that i i mean as best i can find 
um, you know, he's got, Evola's got this reputation as being this arist aristocrat, uh, you know, the Baron Evola and so on. But as far as I can, as far as I can see, that is not true. And his mm. uh, parents were just kind of like, like, dad, what did his dad do again? Uh, dad was a uh, telegraph engineer, um, <laughs> yeah, among, among other things. And his mother was a minor landowner. Um, <laughs> right. But but, but, the, but the thing is, this is not something that Evola pretended to have. Um and I've looked into this a lot, and from, from what I can find, this idea of him being a baron, or you know, from some noble house, or for example, in, in the introduction to his talk on on Evola, you know, uh, uh, Bowden famously says, you know, Baron Evola, the Sicilian aristocrat, and all that. Um, yeah, th this basically comes from some period in the later part of the twentieth century, where English-speaking scholars of Evola mistook this constant reference to him as a baron as being true and what what so so apparently one of the reasons for this is that evola in person was extremely aristocratic in his bearing in the way of, way he spoke he spoke an extremely cultivated form of italian um he spoke french as well he always wore an immaculate suit and there was a the monocle and all this so um mm. this this gave people the impression that he was an aristocrat and, uh, and of course, in Italy, you get given these kind of uh, nicknames. And his nickname among young followers of his was Il Barone, uh, the, the, the Baron, because of, because of his appearance and of his manners. Um, and this seems to have just taken off into a, um, uh, you know, this, 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 this misunderstanding where pe people think he was a real Baron. He, 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 he wasn't, and, he, and he, he never claimed to be. But this, this got so out of hand that even the official, uh, the, the, the letters being sent in the, in the war by, by the SS that were reporting on him referred to him as uh, Baron Evola because of this mistake. Um, but he was I not think we should add also, I think we also should add that this wasn't completely uncommon among certain intellectuals in that time period, yeah. because there are many in the sort of in the uh, German speaking world, people like Lanz von Liebenfels and uh, Rudolf um, von Sebottendorf, uh, they, they weren't really von, right? <laughs> they weren't really arist yeah. aristocrats. Uh, so they, they adopted those names. And that was a common thing for eccentric intellectuals in that time period. So this wasn't completely unique to Evola either, that they were given a sort of a noble name, although they didn't have, um, they didn't come from such a family. Mm -hmm. It's um, the, the, one, of the, one other thing I wanted to mention on that, um, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that there was a kind of, um, you know, the members of the fascist party who didn't care for Ev Evola also gave him this kind of dismissive nickname of the Magic Baron, almost as a kind of diss as well. Yes. Is that true as well? Um, well, it's interesting because it, that originated as a kind of a diss, as you say. It, it was meant to be a, a, a title to disparage him, you know, the Magic Baron. But it eventually became something that people called him as a, as a mark of, uh, of, of respect, you know, as a kind of... Uh, because he, he, I mean, he was probably at a certain point arguably the most knowledgeable man on these kind of magical tr traditions living in europe you know i mean there's a mm. it, it would it wouldn't be incorrect to call him that yeah he, I, th I think he says right at the start of path of cinnabar i came to be known by many titles none of which i had yes um but but anyway ca carry on so I, I thought we i just thought we could clear should clear that up yes we should right at the start because i think um, there are various there are various people like I mean, Bowden, as great as he is, he's probably guilty of this. But I think on some portions of the right, they love to play that bit up because it's kind of mythos and it's cool, you know. Yeah, I mean, the idea that he do was with a baron. monocle is a baron, you know. So. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, also, it, we, we, sh we should say for accuracy, his family may have been um, distant nobility that were that became poor over time, hence why they emigrated from... Um, Palermo to Rome, um, you know. So it's uh, you know not not a not a not totally out of the question that he may have had some sort of aristocratic provenance, but that's basically irrelevant. Um, so anyway, um, he is a young man and he's at U university. He's apparently quite uh, uh, good at his studies. He's studying either mathematics or engineering. It's not clear, um, and. Um, 
right before he's about to complete his training in this university, he quits um, because he says that uh, he doesn't want to be addressed by doctor, which uh, I believe in certain fields, all Italian students, when they when they leave university with, with, with a basic degree, are addressed as such um, in comparison to other countries. Uh, he, he didn't want that. He didn't want this kind of bourgeois academic life. And he brings up a quote that apparently a uh, uh, an Italian aristocrat said once that there are two types of people in life, nobles and people with university degrees. Um, and Evelyn does not want to be in the latter category. Um, hence why he quits. Um, there's also no exact dates for any of this. We don't know when he was at university. We don't know when much of this was happening because in um, Cinnabar, he doesn't give any dates. He just says, in my youth or when I was a young man. Um, so after he leaves university, he begins to take up an interest in painting. Um, and he's always had something of a talent for drawing. Um, and he basically decides to become, he begins a career in art. Um, and at this point, he, he, begin, he, meet, he begins to meet influential people. He meets um, Filippo Marinetti, the leader of the, 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 the futurists. But he basically rejects futurism immediately because he says it's loud and it lacks a kind of inward self-awareness and it lacks a true will to transcendence. He also says it's too American. You know, the, this, this obsession with steel and war and, and automobiles is, is, is latent Americanism, he calls it. And um, he also has a problem with the, quote, chauvinist nationalism of futurism. And this, this is important because right around this time, the First World War breaks out um, in 1914 when Evelyn was only 16 years old. And um, <coughs> what happens is all these avant-garde uh, in, in intellectuals and artists who Evelyn had previously admired, for some reason, they all begin basically to simp very hard for the, for the Allied side. They, 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 they buy into what is essentially this, this mythic and quite, quite stupid idea that the Germans are out to completely destroy Europe as we know it. They're out to completely wreck um, European civilization. Um, in the First World War. And Evola says, well, you know, this is clearly false. And he begins to write to, uh, various articles and, 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 and things like that, arguing that Italy needs to intervene on the side of, of the central powers of, uh, of Germany and, and Austria. And the Ottomans, well, the Ottomans weren't in yet. So just Germany and Austria. Um, and uh, anyway, of course, Italy eventually does intervene on the side of the Allied powers. And, uh, and never, uh, sorry, Nevertheless, Evola goes to war, even though he'd rather be on the other side. Um, and he does an artillery officer's training course uh, and joins the army in the altitudinous Asiago Plateau, high, ab high above the Alps. Um, of course, Evola, one of his main passions in life was mountaineering. So he was extremely good at this. Um, he also may have had some minor cavalry training, um, but his... His experience was basically entirely in the artillery corps in the mountains. Um, he now there's something of um, something I see quoted often is that this idea that Evola fought in the First World War, um, mm -hmm. and for example, in the, with the the, the the commotion with um, Adam and Stitch the other week, um, uh, somebody commented when the original they they posted that original stream of them mocking Evola. Somebody's the top comment was like, you know, how dare you mock this man? You know, he was a veteran of the First World War. He would, you know, he would absolutely beat 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 the crap out of you. Um but Evola himself says that he didn't learn anything from the war because he never really got to do anything in it. He basically was I mean, by the time he was all old enough to go, it was coming to an end. And when he did finally make it there, all he basically did was uh keep this, you know, he was in the artillery up on this peak and he took a load of books and papers with him, and his main activity during that time was, you know, reading and writing, uh, as as always. You know, Ever Evelyn never stops reading. He never stops writing. Um, so that's the First World War, and it ends, and he is discharged. Um, and he just one thing we should himself. add uh, about yeah. the First World War that uh, one of the very few photos that survive from Evola is from the First World War. Yes. Oh, which, uh, which, which photo is that? Well, there's a, a photo of him. Um, you don't see him very clearly, but he, he's wearing a uniform. He's standing, uh, looks like he's standing on a mountain. 
and yes. uh, holding yeah, a, holding it's, a it's, cane uh, of some sort or a stick. Yeah. And he's wearing uh, mountaineering glasses. Yeah, I was I was just going to mention. Um, I I like the Marinetti quote that he that he pulls from: "War is the only hygiene of the world." Yeah, kind of cool quote. That's why I thought I'd mention it. Yes, I agree. Um, yeah, so anyway, he leaves the First World War and returns to Rome. And all of a sudden, he finds himself in this horrendous personal pain. Because what he comes back to is that life he was trying to get away from before the war. He, he, he comes back to a life of bourgeois routine, um, kind of uh, menial work, uh, sort of polite respectability. And uh, he he can't handle this at all. He he just he doesn't want to live it. So he he begins to, and he doesn't really have a purpose at this point. He doesn't really feel a, a, a sense of um, direction. And one of the things he does is he begins to experiment. Well, he begin he has a desire for this transcendence first of all, and then he begins to experiment with unusual narcotics um, and hallucinogens and um, you know. Uh, L I, I, you know, some something like LSD, I presume, and these these sorts of drugs. Mm -hmm. um, but what interests me about his use of these drugs is that he basically says in um, Cinnabar that he never loses control of himself. He never loses awareness. And the point of it was not to lose himself; it was to find himself in a literal sense. It was to to give himself an experience outside of his own consciousness. That he could kind of grasp in order to find a path, um, and I think that would be the difference between what happens here in the twenties with Evola and what would have happened, you know, in in the sixties with with the with, 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 with the hippies, because what they were doing was they were losing self control, they were losing a sense of themselves, and they were losing all sense of a kind of a higher purpose. Evola was doing the opposite; he was doing this to find a higher purpose, and he never lost control of his appetites or urges. I think. Yeah, no, I, mm. I, I, <clears throat> he wasn't the only one either. Uh, Ernst Jünger was another one who was very early with uh, experimenting with psychedelics for spiritual reasons. Yeah, as a yeah, right-wing intellectual. I, I was just going to say um, that I think this is an important thing to grasp for all of his work later on, though, which is that anyone now, when they hear things about you know Buddhism, yoga, even like some of the weirder things like magic or whatever it it draws certain images to mind right um and my understanding is that it, where Evola is concerned it, it it's almost never any of those kind of more like kind of wacky things that you might be thinking of like you know somebody with a uh, somebody in a trance with a miss with a bloody crystal ball or it's never it like all of those things are uh, kind of critiqued in one of the books that he that he, that he would come to write. It's it's never um, losing yourself or you know um, alternate states of mind or anything like that. Like that, mm -hmm. um, everything he does is uh, deliberately fully conscious. Uh, as far as I understand, that he even rejects the Freudian notion of the subconscious as being something. Um, you know the that pulls you downwards basically he's always trying to transcend and move upwards so i think it's just an important thing to bear in mind when thinking about uh, what evola means by these things he's not talking about going to go into a rave taking ecstasy and finding yourself you know no yeah the, his uh, one of his colleagues in traditionalism rene Guénon, uh, was very strict about that criticizing what he called false traditions or false sort of uh, religious circles he wasn't uh, very fond of uh, the theos theosophical school for example or other sort of false traditions so they were very picky about uh, what they approved of <laughs> in those circles yes um i should say i mentioned uh, lsd back there but as mr d has pointed out lsd was not actually this was pre-lsd um but you know that that kind of thing um psycho hallucinogenic drugs um now where were we so yes he's come back to rome he has this crisis he starts to use drugs um and he happens upon a very important realization um, about himself in that he 
he basically comes to the conclusion that this yearning for transcendence is not something that's been grafted onto him. It's something that's innate to him and something that pre-existed him in his essence, that, that this is something that was chosen for him before he was conceived into life. Um, and this principle will basically go on to have a very deep influence on the rest of his work. Um, so anyway, yes, the war's over. Uh, so this is when he be begins to make a career in art. He becomes involved with uh, Dadaism, um, and he, he becomes acquainted with Tristan Z Zara, I think is the pronunciation. Um, and um, he's he becomes kind of um, uh, in, uh, acquainted with this movement because it seeks to do away with all conventional ideas about art and about what art is and about what society is, even about what humanity is. It's a kind of, um, it describes itself as the virgin microbe in the sense that it wants to, you know, take everything back to it like square one in a sense of, well, what is the barest essence of this? And then where do we go from there? And of course, Evola is aware from the outset that, that this is not going to go particularly far because its entire philosophy is based around it and it's, well, it, you know it's not it's not art it's not anything it doesn't stand for anything on purpose um so once dadaism begins to wane he looks for another movement um and he looks upon surrealism briefly um but he rejects it uh because he thinks it's regressive um he thinks it's actually taking a step back um, because by the time he gets to it, it's already covered in academic convention. It's already becoming mm -hmm. commercialized. It's already it's already hanging in the homes of rich in in, uh, in you know politicians and doesn't, industrialists and that sort of. Thing. Do, doesn't he say somewhere? Because <clears throat> I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Evola ever disavows his uh, Dadaist art. And um, it may be in that interview I watched, but he he basically says like. Or it could be in Cinnabar, I can't remember. Um, but he basically says, like, I, I'm the only one who didn't sell out my principles, basically. I stayed true to what we um, were trying to do. Yeah, he very much implies it. Or he, he says that it was him and a very small group of people that didn't end up uh, taking the, the path that the rest of them did. But by which he means becoming conventional, conformist, bourgeois, yeah. joining the establishment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Basically, yes, um, which is why he consistently begins an art form or an art movement is particularly talented at it. He, he, he could he could go all the way and then he always just stops. He always starts because, well, no, now now the, the life has gone from this movement. Um, so I'm going to have to do something else. He, he is saying that we should show the art. Uh, he did share it earlier on. on uh, yes, he we, tweeted it. Have a look? Yeah, let's have, have a look, look at that. Um, so on this point, uh, in 1920... His career is already picking up very quickly, and he exhibits 54 paintings at the Bragaglia Gallery in Rome, um, which are the ones you're seeing now. These um, uh, Dadaist paintings with influences of surrealism and, and futurism and etc. I mean, what do we make of these? I, I don't know anything about Dadaism, so... Um... I think they're interesting. I can't, I can't really speak to it as a as an art critic because I'm not one. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know what to make of them. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think it's probably important to point out, and we'll probably get into this more later as well. The the claim that he was a fascist, uh, which you'll hear in mainstream circles, and this is of course something that. Uh, a lot of fascists weren't happy about, right? So he didn't really sit comfortably in any political camp at all uh, because of these sort of eccentric uh, characteristics. Well, they, they didn't. The fascists didn't like him doing Dada, Dadaist work because <laughs> no. he, he he didn't get on with the futurists. But as I understand it, fasc, uh, the fascists were kind of up for futurism, right? But he didn't he didn't like futurism. Um, yeah, absolutely. Futurism was yes. a, was an important part of uh, of fascism. We should also uh, add that M Mr. D has corrected us. These are not strictly Dadaist works. Um, these are more kind of abstract, surrealist type things. Um, I, I, sh I should add, I, I didn't make it clear enough. Um, his his involvement with 
Dadaism was less to do with the visual arts and more to do with poetry. Um, most of his contributions to that were poetic, um, which is more difficult. I can't really say anything about them because they haven't been tr translated. Um, not not proper. Uh, I, there are some floating around out there, but not not ones I can. Rely do you have, do you have, I, I know where to find a little kind of fragment. Do you want to have a little look? Yes, please. I'll uh, you carry on talking. I'll go. I'll go and find them. All right. Um, so yes, this is twenty. Uh, not, this is nineteen twenty. As you can see, his career t has quite. He's quite a number of successes here. Um, so as I said, he exhibited fifty-four paintings at, at, at the Pergaglia in Rome. He then exhibits sixty paintings in a one-man show at the De Sturm in Berlin, um, and then he has another exhibition at the Bragaglia the following year. Um, so he, he does make quite a, an explosion onto the art scene uh, around this time, and I'll, I don't want to go any further until we've seen this, these poems, fragments of poems. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember uh, exactly where to define them now, but it's this, it's this chap, um, it's this chap called, uh, he's run this website for many years. Let me see if I can... Exactly, find that. Can't find. Um, he does like his own transla translations of little little fragments of things. But is it um Evel as he is? I think uh, no. I, it's the other one. Um, Bru Bruno. Well, let's have a look. Maybe it is on here. Evel as Excellent. he is. That is by Bruno Cargu. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's the it's the other chap who runs that um, Gina Gina Bo, Gina Ho, uh, Forum or whatever, yeah. Yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, all right, you're you're gonna have to bear with me a second because uh, I'm I, I'm having extreme trouble with my eye, <laughs> with my eye key. Believe it or not. Ah, um, yes. This. <laughs> um, I've I remapped sent you the link my eight... in the private oh, chat. Oh, fantastic! There. Oh, fantastic! Will help me uh, immensely. So, in the meantime, uh, Mr. Frody, do you have any uh, comments on Evelyn's life so far? Well, I think we should point out that uh, we don't really have any uh, information translated into English. There's more stuff available in Italian. Uh, mm -hmm. The only thing that resembles a biography uh, is. Uh, a book that came out last year by Gianfranco de Turis, yes, uh, I have called it in front of Julius me. Evola, The Philosopher and Magician in War. And mm -hmm. that only deals with the period in you know the late part of the Second World War and the period immediately after that. So that it's nothing like a complete um, biography Although... of his life. Uh, so that's written by... Uh, and Italy, we have to bear in mind that you know compared to... Uh, Northern Europe, Scandinavia, England, the United States, uh, Italians are far less neurotic about this part of their history. So that even a uh, the the author of this book is uh, a sort of a popular mainstream cultural figure in mm -hmm. in Italy, but he's still uh, you know sympathetic to Evola. So he so it's you don't have to denounce uh, a historical figure like this if you live in Italy, <laughs> right? So so yeah. it, it it also means that we get a pretty fair uh, image of, um, of what happened. And the other thing uh, with regard to sources for uh, his life is there's an essay in Men Among the Ruins, which is very thorough, uh, a, a thorough introduction. And, and then there is this radical traditionalist journal called Tyr Journal, uh, T-Y-R, uh, the Nordic God. It's a radical mm -hmm. traditionalist journal that started in about 20 years ago. And I think it's in volume four that they have a, a, a lengthy essay review of some um, Italian biography. So through these sort of longer reviews of Italian works, we can get uh, an image of some of the things um, about Ebola as well. Yes. Um, I would add that book by um, Gianfranco de, de Torres. Um, it covers, it, as you say, it covers that short period, those, those few years after the war, uh, mainly, and in great exhaustive detail. Um, but it does 
uh, also have a lot of chapters on general urban urban myths about Evola's life and tries to answer some of the mysteries about his uh, his his being and whereabouts and all the things he did. Um, and as to your point about sorry, yeah. but as to your I, point I don't about the, be able to find these poems by the way, sadly. No, okay. unless unless anybody uh, has a link to them, I can't I can't seem to find them. But um, to, to your point about uh, the Italians being a bit less uh, squeamish about this hard part of their history, um, I have a friend who grew up in Italy, and they were even... Ever Evola is actually mentioned in their school curriculum as an important philosopher of the, of the last last century. Um, they don't, they, and they're not given any of his works to read, but he is. Uh, they, they are taught about him. So that is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I, I noticed when I was looking around for, for this uh, weekend that there's like little TV bits and things that Mm -hmm. uh, people talking about Evola in Italian. I don't know what they're saying, but just just the fact that it's mentioned on TV is. Um, but then, and then again, it was quite a you know, fascist regime went on for quite a long time. You know, was it nineteen twenty? I mean, literally from the, the end of the fascist twenty years. It was it was twenty nineteen twenty two, I think, up to the end of the. Well, I mean, technically up to nineteen forty three, really. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it, it not quite twenty. Well, a little bit over twenty years, but it's always referred to as the twenty years in Italy. I think. Yeah. What, what, what were Mussolini's atrocities, other than like, you know, being on the wrong side of the war? I mean, that's pretty much what what did him in in the end, isn't it? <laughs> he, he, <laughs> yeah. he chose the wrong side. I mean, he he could have been a um, Franco like 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 figure. Um, and in in fact, it, we he, we're often even on the right, we're led to think of him as a kind of, uh, you know, bravado filled clown but yeah. looking into it he was actually you know i i close to the point of saying that the fascist government of italy was possibly one of the best non-liberal alternatives out there that we've ever seen like post enlightenment basically i mean like it was a a, a shockingly uh attractive state and of course it had it did have some quite serious flaws that we should address as well but you know i'm um quite keen on what Mussolini was able to do and what his yeah. personal abilities were. See, when I was taught about this period, uh, you know, my history teacher would always just say, oh, yeah, and of course, Mussolini, he was a half -wit. But um, as far as I can see, he was, I mean, whatever else you say about him, Mussolini was an intellectual. Like He, he was an intellectual. Like, like he, he thought about what he was doing. He was engaged with the thinkers of his time. Um I mean, I'm I'm also a fan of the Italian elite theorists, of course, and um, I know uh, you know I want I know one of the things that Moscow was fairly bit bitter about was the fact that Pareto was a kind of favourite of Mussolini's, um, yeah. whereas whereas Moscow always seemed to be you know kind of a little bit ignored. But it seems like it seems like Mussolini was reading Evola as well uh, at different well, I mean, times. He yeah. he was, and of course, you know, if if you read about M Mussolini's early years in power, I mean. Him, him, you know, coming into Rome, le be be being declared the prime minister, and then what he does in the next like five, ten years is some really incredible political like power play. I mean, it's it's some really smart stuff. The man was not an idiot by any stretch of the imagination. He was able to like simultaneously bring on board like communists, the average worker, the aristocracy, the church. The trade unit. He he was able to like mastermind this great Palpatine esque plan where like you know I I I am the trade unions now. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know he gets the he's got the army on side from the beginning. I mean, honestly, if if he hadn't gone to war on the side of the Axis when he did, uh, you may have been looking at a very successful and, long term and, regime. And don't forget my favorite act of his, which is just going and burning down those uh, newspapers. Which yeah. I, which I still Com communist think is, newspapers just burn them. Down. One of the coolest things that any leader's ever done. But yeah, um, it, for me, well, I think we have to say as well about fascism uh, that that it has a bad reputation today is pretty much a, a sort of a post-war construction as well because I think it was Trotsky who started using fascism as this generic slur, right? And mm -hmm. in the post-war era. Um, we've started using this term fascism not uh, about the Italian 
government or the Italian ideology, but as a generic term about all the forces that fought against communism in the Second World War. And there yeah. are huge differences between National Socialism <laughs> and Fascism, but now uh, people use the sort of derogatory, gen generic word, Fascism, to denounce all of it. And mo mostly what they mean is National Socialism. So yeah, they the, yeah. because mostly people don't know anything about Italian fascism. <laughs> they have just bought into this um, pejorative use of the term that uh, Trotsky was one of the first to coin as that everyone who isn't on board with us, that is the communists, is a fascist and you're a fascist. And now you'll hear uh, people say that Donald Trump is a fascist and it's just a generic slur that he's not on board with the leftist project. Yeah, well, one of the um, best books I've read on that, you may have other recommendations but for me Paul, Paul Gottfried's fascism the career of a concept um, is incredibly detailed academic study on what fascism is what it isn't mm -hmm. um, you know how it differs from national socialism um, you know how what all the other movements like he looks at Franco he looks at and really all these things get lumped in as one as, as the same thing when, when in fact uh, Italian fascism in particular had very had had its own intellectual roots and was its own thing, really. Yes. Um, <clears throat> absolutely. Right, yeah. And you can also find uh, Trotsky's articles about this. And uh, Trotsky is credited for uh, coining racism in, in the sort of generic uh, pejorative sense as well, as well as fascism. So uh, the communists were good at, at creating these magic words, um, these sort of shut up words that you can just call someone something and that means you've won. Uh, and, and fascism is one of those words. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's right now it just is a slur. <laughs> it it yeah, doesn't after, really refer to after anything. After the war, the, the Frankfurt School put that into hyperdrive, especially in Germany, um, where they, where it's like the expense. So it's not just uh, the definition of fascism expands, they also they also expand it. Um, they also expand it to other things like you know, the very idea of being German, for example, or Christian, or yeah. Um, you know, there's also I I did a video called "What Yuri Besmanov Didn't Tell You" uh, that you'll find in my archives, where I go into that whole process of what they call denazification, where they, you know, it, it expanded a lot more than just the mustache man to basically come. I mean. And if you ask me, this this has actually been expanded to start attacking like British, uh, American, Scandinavian. Doesn't matter where you're from. It's the same the same process as at play today. Uh, basically, the same Frankfurt School um, expansion of like a, the original sin of being like European or Christian, essentially. Um, so yeah, you also have the the phenomenon that the revolution always devours its children uh, and so we've had this drift and i'm said many times that if you know if karl marx was alive today thinking the same things he thought back then he would be called a nazi and the same thing with in the second world war uh, essentially everyone on the allied side on the, the com even the communists uh, by today's leftist standards they would be called fascists so <laughs> these these words have a very sort of malleable meaning it's all entropy yeah, yeah, but um, so, so let, let's get let's get back to the timeline then. Ha. It with with all of that said, though, Evola was still not really, not really a fascist. <laughs> we so, will yeah. get onto this, um, yeah. but but so that's that's coming up. We have we have to get through the, the, the philosophical phase first, and then we'll get onto his activities under under Mussolini. Um, so as I say, 1920, he had all those exhibitions. He was doing very well artistically. He published his poetry in s several. Um, uh cr critical pieces 1921 comes around however though and he stops painting uh he just stops he says that he's exhausted all possibilities in that field and he publishes his last few poems and he calls it quits for art um basically um and so begins the philosophical phase which goes on for the next six years till 1927 so as has been briefly mentioned before um he becomes interested in theosophy um but he finds this theosophical movement, as was mentioned, um, Guénon hated it too. It was a very, but by that point, it had become this very establishment, kind of watered down uh, uh, club for, for sort of cranks, really. Um, this, this thing with Madame 
uh, what's the name? Blatowski, Blavatsky. Blatsky. Adam yeah. Blavatsky. Blavatsky. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So on paper, Theosophy's aim is to bring together various pieces of different faiths and different sort of movements of the of, of, of the occult and, and paganism and all sorts of things to, to kind of mix elements of these together into one I suppose calling it a faith wouldn't really be correct, but basically into one um, one mystical I I ideology or kind of a new way of, of looking at things. Um, I believe, if that's correct, if I'm not messing that up. Well, Blavatsky claimed to have gone to um well, it's many years ago. It's at Agartha or some of these secret places in in Asia, uh, mm -hmm. and and received this teaching, which which is she claimed was a ge genuine teaching, right? Which she wrote down in the Secret Doctrine, which which is a huge yeah. volume, and of course it has elements from all kinds of things. And I don't think it it always was uh, a sort of a what we today would consider politically correct, uh, because. It had adherents from, you know, very radical uh, right-wing occult circles in Germany and Austria, uh, to the Lanz von Liebenfels and Guido von List, and those kinds of people who were, um, you know, created many of the ideas that went on to live in the sort of national socialist uh, intellectual circles. So th it was very. Um, it had a diverse history, <laughs> right? But uh, after, yeah, in, in in more modern times, it's become very uh, politically correct. Okay, okay so carry on, huh? On me. Um, so yes, the uh, he, he basically finds no uh, joy in the in the theosophical society. Um, but what happens instead is that through his his contacts with this kind of brief flirtation with the movement, he's introduced various Eastern texts of so Hindu texts, Chinese texts, in Indonesian texts, all these kind of um, very, very ancient forms of spirituality. And this grips him totally. Um, this is really where the foundation of Everless, Everless spirituality, I, I believe at least, comes from for the rest of his life. Um, this period where he's He's really beginning to understand certain truths that are sourced sourced from the East. Um, and in fact, I believe his first um, uh, published philosophical work was an introduction to Lao Tzu's uh, uh, Tao Te Ching. Um, and I've got a quote here where he says, um, in, in Lao Tzu, I saw a man who had managed to map a metaphysics of transcendence, which could act as the model for the superior and self-fulfilled individual. By avoiding mysticism and faith in favor of a magical, luminous impassibility. Um, so that is the kind of keystone there for Evola's faith. Um, and then following that, he writes essays on magical idealism. And uh, I don't have that. It's one of the Evola works I don't actually have. I can't get hold of it. Um, but from well, that, I've, so, John Morgan suggested it has been translated, but I, I, I haven't been able to find it anywhere either. No, if he um, said it, I if he says it exists, it must exist. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't think it's been translated. Uh, no. Not his first philosophical book, no. Um, and then following that, yeah, some essays on magical idealism, and in in the preface, this is from Cinnabar. Um, it says, uh, there's a quote by a French philosopher called Jules Lagneau, who none of his works are translated into English, but there's a quote from him and it says, philosophy is the kind of reflection which ultimately recognizes its own insufficiency and the need for an absolute action arising within. And I think why this is so important is because whenever you read Evola, you always have to do so with the understanding that this is not some kind of overarching complete system in of itself. This is not like this is this is not a transcendence in of itself. This is a kind of guide to it. All all Leveler's works are pointing you in a certain way, but they're not going to carry you there. Um, you know, this is this is what that means. There's, it's it, it's a, it's a reflection which is important, but it's it's it recognizes its own insufficiency. And there's that phrase: the need for an absolute action arising within. There has to be that absolute individual force driving you on, and it has to come from you.
to get there um so you know very very important um very important piece of evil doctrine yeah i mean well I, th this will be something that we'll, we'll probably touch on but um you know as a, as an academic who's written a number of books i i kind of recognize something in all of Evola's works, which is that almost every book is built on a book. Yeah. Right. So, uh, or, or they're built on some like prime text. So, even Revolt of the Modern World is built on Crisis of the Modern World. Um, I'm not saying they're the same book, right? I'm just saying that there's usually a, a text underneath the text. Like the, you know, Eros is the, is built on the Otto Weininger's uh, Sex and Culture. Um, the uh, yoga of power is built on top of, uh, you know, those, uh, uh, you know, those early, uh, those early texts. He's looking at, um, same as the doctrine of the awakening, is you know, mm -hmm. built on top of those uh, Pali translations that he did. Um, and uh, this is this is something I've noticed about all all of Evola. Basically, is that there's usually a, an ur text underneath the text that he's either responding to, critiquing. You know, sometimes it's Nietzsche, sometimes it's uh, somebody else. I mean, would you, would you agree with that basic assessment? Uh, even and it, and it sounds I haven't obviously they're not available these these early works, um, but it sounds to me like this is him like going through a lot of uh, you know idealist philosophers and like you know re responding in a kind of fairly straightforward scholarly manner. I, th I think so, and I think as uh, as John Morgan pointed out in your interview with him that he didn't really, uh, at least not later, uh, he didn't really claim to, you know, any, any sort of originality. Uh, he was more trying to sort of uh, tease out the 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 essence of previous works as well. So, so there's very much to that, and I also got a message from John saying that introduction to magic idealism is the word uh, is the work that he uh, mentioned, and that's a book of excerpts from uh, Evola's idealist work. Right. Okay. Um, right. So what what happens what happens now? Um, the closest I've got to reading any of this philosophical period is this. I mean, it's quite a long chapter in Cinnabar, right? It's like probably the longest chapter in there where you get the gist of it seemed like a lot of dense philosophical um responses to german idealism you know you're talking about like Schelling and fichte and all these well kind of um something that should be noted is that the intellectual climate of italy at this time was completely and utterly dominated by neo hegelianism which was pushed by Giovanni Gentile and Benedetto Croce. Um, they were the two kind of intellectual heavyweights of the entire country. Um, and they were the ones that pushed that kind of doctrine. So Ev Evola's works were never really taken in in mainstream um, academic groups at this time. It should be noted. Yeah, the, the other thing that uh, I think is worth mentioning is that um, as far as I can tell, Evola self-taught, uh, like basically taught himself how to speak German and to the level where he was able to translate Spangler's Decline of the West, which is pretty well, remarkable. I've, um, um, he, he, he apparently had some friends that sp spoke the language, but I've actually also read that that was how he taught himself German, was by translating uh, uh, Spangler's Decline of the West. Oh, my God. Um, and this this was quite a common thing at the time. I mean, the pe people who were intelligent back then, one of the quickest ways to learn a language so you could write it and read it was to do a translation. Um, a number of intellectuals taught themselves German, sort of leftist intellectuals in the 1800s would teach themselves German by translating Marx um, into their own language. Uh, for example, a, lo a lot of Russians did that to learn German, for example. Um, they would just translate Marx or Engels. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a perfectly viable method. I don't know how, how accurate your skill in the language would be if you did that, but it's, you know, it's a way. Maybe I might teach myself Italian by, um, Maybe. by, um, but getting through that, um, bibliography I bought of all of Evola's essays. Well, there you go. It's only available in Italian. I think I translate his bibliography. So oh, right. Carry on. after this, the first of his really major works is published, and it's called The Theory and Phenomenology of the Absolute Individual. 
Um, now, he's written this between 1925 and 1927. But the trouble is that it's such a long book and it's so complex in nature. And because, as, as, as I mentioned, the whole climate is, is dominated by this very stifling kind of neo-Hegelian rationalism, um, he can't get it published. He, he can't find a publisher. And there's a, there's, there's, there's a point at which he says to a friend who's very influential in, in, in the publishing world, he goes, look, why don't you publish it under your name? Just because Evola was so keen to get these ideas out there. He didn't care whether it was his name on it or not. You know, he just, he just wanted these ideas in, in, in the discourse. His, his, ass, his idea was to kind of steer people and steer the states in a certain way. Um, but that, that ended up falling through. And it didn't get published until 1930. Um, and uh, Evola began to be looked at with some scorn by the academic elite of his time, who called his ideas superstitious and counter-enlightenment, in, in, um, which, of course, this, this, the, the, the latter is true, the former is not, I think. Um, so, you know, but it, it's interesting to see that counter-enlightenment in itself was used as an attack. On Evola's work, just just to be against the Enlightenment is uh, is a mark against you. Um, so in 1927, the Ur group is formed. Um, I know that in um, the chap you had on before was pronouncing it U R. Um, I I'm going to use Ur because it's named after the um, the ancient uh, kingdom of Ur, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to stick to that. Um, and this is when he first meets Rene Guénon. Um, and they begin to exchange letters. Um, and then in 1928, he publishes a book called Pagan Imperialism. Um, yeah, just, just before we go, yeah. on, go, go on to this, sorry to interrupt you, um, Pat. There's, did you, you mention the, the fact that he almost committed suicide, right? Did I miss that? Uh, well, that, that was during his um, crisis. Uh, after yeah, during, during his crisis. But um, yeah. I... Um, I uh, actually was reading the correspondence between Evola and Guinon. In fact, I say we've only got the Guinon letters as far as I can see. We don't have the Evola, the letters that Evola wrote to Guinon for whatever reason. But um, there is, there is an early um, letter from Guinon to one of his friends as early as 1925 mm. where a young Evola has written to Guinon and said, you know, I don't know, he's asking me a few questions and went on saying, like, you know, this guy's really young, he's in his early 20s, I don't think he understands my work, but um, basically he still sees something in him, though. He's like, oh, I, yeah. I don't know, I like his spirit or whatever. Which and watch I think it's, with great interest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I just think it's worth it's worth mentioning that um, there is, I don't know if Gwenon bothered to write back at that time, but that shows at the very least that Evola was reading Guinan as early as 1925, which is probably a bit mm -hmm. earlier than people think. Yes. Um, so anyway, this pagan imperialism of 1928, this is when Evola starts to become some something of a household name in, in academic grounds in Italy, um, because it's a massive attack on Christianity and Catholicism in particular. And what he alleges is that, Chris, is that Catholicism is holding back fascism. Um, and it includes an open letter to the government in which um, he wants them to adopt a kind of religious, a kind of pagan caste uh, system and kind of get rid of the Catholic Church. Um, and as, as you mentioned, with you know, Mussolini reading books, Mussolini famously read this because um, this book caused such a stir. It was on the, you know, the, it was on the pages of papers and, you know, people were talking about it and the church had a big response to it. And, um, Mussolini uh, was obviously not a particularly Catholic man. I, th I believe he remained inwardly very anti-clerical for most of his life. Um, but as leader of, 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 of Italy, he was kind of required to keep good relations with the church um, because it was a potential f threat to his power, essentially. Um, and in 1923, he actually signed treaties with the church, which established the Vatican as we know it today, um, and ended the, the conflict between the Italian state and the, 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 the Holy See. Um, although what Mussolini then did again, you know, being quite a canny player here is that he kind of, he would brandish this book at clergy or at the Pope, whenever they spoke. Um, and he would kind of say, look, if, if you don't play along with us here, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever this says and, you know, get, get, get rid of you 
um, will start being anti-clerical. Um, and several major Catholic publications declare Evola to be a Satanist. Um, so he now has this kind of dark horse reputation uh, in Italy. Um, and uh, anyway, in 1930, the Ur group uh, ceases its publications. Should we, should we just uh, mention a little bit about pagan imperialism? Because yeah. um, of all of Evola's works, it's the most like, I mean, I think I said on a... Um, it's very much like the work of a young of a young man with a lot of fire in his belly type thing, and it's a lot more polemical than anything else. Um, that the you know the, the more mature Evola or the or the the Evola of revolts against the modern world, you know, well, when he finally finds his voice. Um, so he's kind of excitable there, and he he almost I, I don't want to say he disowns it, but he kind of seems to have. A little bit of regret about the the tone that he took on in that work. Do you think we should could say a it's, bit more about that? It's it's one of the only things he wrote that he later basically kind of said. You know, this was I. He basically, for want of a better word, took it back because um, his his later thoughts on Catholicism were a lot more positive, as as we'll go go on to in a bit. Um, and uh, he basically said, you know, this this was extreme and and quite silly. Um, well, well, he he's but he still he still holds on to a lot of the ideas though, and I think, um, uh, and, and this was actually the the one book that I reread for this session, and I, I found it very interesting. And I mean, there are several reasons why I reread it. It's it's short, so I had time to reread it, and I also had access to it. But I, it's also it also carries it's sort of an embryo of what comes out in Revolt Against the Modern World, because just like you said, it was. Um, it was first published uh, as as pagan imperialism in Italian in, in 28. I think he was exactly 30 years old when it came yes. out. And then it was published again in German, and he sort of rewrote it in German uh, five years later when he was 35. And um, basically it carries, I think it's sort of a short version of a lot of the ideas that you get from Revolt Against the Modern World, so in a sense, even though he, you know, maybe didn't like it later, <laughs> it's mm. it's um, he's very direct and uh, he's crude, but I think he presents his ideas in a very clear way, so you know what he means. And mm. uh, you know, it it didn't it wasn't published very long before uh, his other books uh, on the similar topics. So I don't think he changed his. You know, I think he. Um, you know, from what I've understood, that he regretted the very harsh tone, but in general, the ideas I think he kept to even later as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, the, the one other thing I'll say is that um, I don't know if you've noticed this, Frodi, but uh, let's just say like the slightly edgier third positionists, uh, you know, that seems to have some popularity in those sorts of circles. Like the kind mm. of, uh, would you agree with that? Like I kind of just see it, like you know, every once in a while I'll come across like, well, who who are these people talking about that? Oh, right, it's uh, it's that sort of place. Um, and I think maybe the directness and the kind of, uh, the kind of vim of it may speak to, um, certain young certain young men in right wing movements. I'll just put it that way. I think so too, but uh, it's also, I mean, a lot of young people tend to be interested in Evola and he's been popular in the Anglophone world in the, in the last you know decade as popularity has gone up and especially in connection to uh, politics and on the right and I think that what people are inspired by isn't so much the subtlety of his more mature work but the passion uh, and the involvement on, of his earlier work and um, but I don't know if it's very popular, this one, because it's it, it used to be published in English. Well, it's published in two versions in English. Heathen Imperialism came out by Cariou many, many years ago. I think it, it's probably rare these days. And now, uh, just a couple of years ago, it came out as Pagan Imperialism in a new mm -hmm. translation. And um, so now I think it's uh, available everywhere. Um, and basically the idea, I could, should you want me to say something about the idea he presents in this work yeah, absolutely yes, yeah. so what he what really comes out here is 
two things. It's his inspiration by Nietzsche and his inspiration by uh, Genon. And one thing that he takes from Nietzsche is, of course, the idea that Nietzsche presents in uh, the genealogy of morals, which is the idea of sort of a slave revolt. And uh, what he talks about is the idea that our perspective, our moral perspective, has shifted from the aristocracy to a sort of a slave morality, uh, Nietzsche talks about. And what he means is that instead of seeing the world and morality through the eyes of an aristocracy that strives for greatness, we have started seeing uh, the world and the moral framework through the eyes of the victims. So we start seeing everything as victims and we start appealing to a sort of a victim narrative. And uh, that's really clear today, of course, that the way you show that you're good is that you are the victim of some sort of injustice. Not that you've accomplished anything great, but that you are the victim of some sort of injustice. And uh, another thing that, um, and this is something that Evola definitely adopts from Nietzsche and criticizes uh, Christianity for that. And um, another thing that he criticizes Christianity for is the separation of the sacred uh, from the state. So the split, whereas in ancient Rome, uh, the emperor or the, the, the head of the state would be the leader both in a worldly sense and in, the, in a religious sense. But with Christianity, uh, there is a split. And so you have a worldly leader, which is the emperor, and then you have the pope. And there was, a, you know, there was tension between these two camps in medieval Italy. And so you had some people supporting the pope, some people supporting the emperor. And this is what he calls Ghibellism. And the, the Ghibellines, I don't really know how to pronounce it, but the Ghibellines, they supported the emperor. Because what Evola says is that a... Uh, I, noted some uh, quotes from the book here. What he says is that Christianity is a vehicle or a source of uh, the subversion of the, the sort of the powers of, and these are sort of almost supernatural powers. These aren't only material forces. He talks about the forces of uh, the sort of the decadence of the modern world. And one of the ways this has come into uh, the Roman Empire was through Christianity. And uh, the emperor, of, although he was nominally Christian, uh, still was a the empire was still a continuation of the ancient Roman Empire. And, uh, and so the, the pope was more on the side of, of subversion and the values mm. of the modern world which came in through Christianity, whereas the emperor, uh, which Evola supported, was more on the side of the ancient Roman tradition. And this is where uh, Genon and Evola disagreed because Genon uh, supported the primacy or the, that the, the, the religious authority should have the upper hand, whereas uh, Evola thought that the the uh, emperor or the the state uh, should have the upper hand because that was a more pure continuation of the ancient or the traditional form, and uh, and so he said that Christianity, as such, that is in its primitive Semitic and revolutionary aspect, is the mystical analog of the French Revolution of yesterday and of communism and socialism today, and that that's that's pure Nietzsche. Uh, uh, what he says is, we call for a decisive, unconditional, integral return to the Nordic pagan tradition. Um, so what he says, and this is something that, uh, for example, and that Alain de Benoit in the French New Right has also continued, that because of this separation of the sacred from the worldly, the where, where what he accuses Christianity of doing is of removing the sacred from this world into um, into a, a, a kingdom of uh, uh, you know the afterlife or somewhere else, and so the political realm loses its sacred legitimacy because now the sacred is somewhere else. And so we enter into this downward spiral as he sees it, 
and uh, we end up with you know democracy and everything else and now we have a democracy where you know politicians don't really care about the sacred or any greater uh, sort of big picture or uh, any sacred ideals they just care about how to win popular support in the next four years <laughs> right uh, and mm -hmm. and this is something that he sees as a consequence of the removal of the sacred from the political because of this split between the emperor and the pope yeah and you're i think you're you're right to pick up on this as a something that is a it's not just a through line it's it's absolutely central to his thought in revolts against the modern world and yeah uh, and onwards he's obsessed with this uh, ghibelline restoration mm -hmm. the idea i mean as I understand it, the that was the Holy Roman Emperor, right? Back in yeah, um, it's, it's, as against the as against the papal authority of, of that era, and he tended to side with the imperial the imperial powers. Um, but it's also uh, it has a, a consequence for how he sees the the four ages too, um, whereby uh, this. Uh, divine king who has both temporal power and almost like divine power in, in one mm -hmm. um once uh once it goes from the golden age to the silver age in that silver age in evola's conception the, the the priest class is kind of feminine it's kind of passive mm -hmm. and um this is what allows the forces of subvert like the merchants essentially to take over Whereas in uh, Guinan, and I think I, I talked to, uh, either to John or, or Kat about this earlier on, in Guinan it's the other way around, where the where the golden age is led by the priests, um, and uh, and then it devolves to like merely military leaders. Um, mm. where, where, whereas at Evola, uh, Evola wants that kind of warrior priest king, all, all in one, and he sees this as a kind of spirit of the West type thing um mm -hmm. so it, yeah it, it i think you're right to pick up on that as something that he would never lose because he's, he's very committed to um he's very committed to the idea that the that the leader is going to have like be a man of action as well exactly. not just a, not just a man of pure pure kind of not just the the idea that uh, i mean i always remember uh my dad's iranian when uh when when, when khomeini came to power he said I'm going to go and sit in the mountains and, uh, you know, be, be the old fashioned, uh, spiritual leader. Obviously that didn't happen, but the idea is there in the East, right. That, the, that the, you're going to be a, a, re a religious man of that kind. Um, but anyway, hat, shall we let you now move us from pagan imperialism to where he goes next? Uh, yes. So after the big furore around pagan imperialism, um, the year 1930 comes around, and it's one of the most eventful years in Evola's life, basically. And unusually, we have an enormous amount of biographical information on it because it was a national scandal, essentially. Um, so, right at the start of 1930, in the January of that year, the Ur Group stops publishing material. The, the group, they, they, they still hold meetings, they just don't put anything out. Um, and what happens is instead, Evola becomes head of a small magazine initially called La Torre, which is Italian for The Tower. Um, and he, he begins to publish this very late in 29. And the first issue comes out in January of 1930. Um, and its, it's subtitle was A Paper of Many Approaches to One Tradition. Um, because, of course, you know, this is where we're beginning to get into uh, perennialism. And uh, the idea that, you know, all these different faiths, all these different creeds all lead back to the same metaphysical truth. Um, and it was a very elitist, very sort of super po uh, super political in the sense that it didn't ever talk about sort of current politics. It just concerned itself with this kind of elite theory. Um, and in the first edition, Evola and his, his staff declared that they were neither fascists nor anti-fascists. And they would only support fascism in as much as it would support them and their ideas. Um, and from then on, they began to criticize the government of Italy for placing politics above ideals. So, of course, Evola's conception of politics is one in which you have these ideals, you have spiritual truths, 
and you have metaphysics that cannot be broken essentially um and then that's how you order your, your politics the the the, cons the kind of um the, the kind of machiavellian sort of politicking comes second to that always um mm. and of course that's not what Mussolini was doing Mussolini was was I mean you know there there wasn't really an ideal at play re realistically um and this began to stir up a backlash and it came to a head when a reader sent them a letter which was published in which he said that um gentlemen are you aware that your journal does not share the opinions of uh, the leader Mussolini and uh, Evola replied all the worse for Mussolini um and this basically marked him him and his journal out as enemies of, of the fascist regime um so there's then a torrent of slander they get taken to court people try to do lawsuits against them they get physically intimidated the the administrative powers in the region start to start to sort of mess with them um it got to the point where Evola required a squad of bodyguards uh to go around in public um just because uh it, you know there was a risk of him being being lynched um and the the magazine posed quite the headache for the regime um because it didn't fit any of the anti-fascist categories that would have allowed them to legally take it down um because that was pretty much all leftist uh papers that they'd marked out to be just taken down immediately um and so what happened was the police informally asked Ebola to stop publishing this journal, but he ignored them. And so as such, all the printing houses in Rome were forbidden to print this, the, the copy of, of the tower. Um, so it just, you know, shut, shut them down. So Ebola wrote a letter to the Minister of the Interior, who he knew, um, but the reply was kind of vague and unhelpful, and there was clearly some some pressure from, from above there. So um, Ebola decided he'd, he'd had enough and uh, quit the magazine, and went for a convalescence up, up in the mountains. Um, so the magazine, the whole affair was about five months long. Uh, but his trouble didn't end there because some diehard fascist goons from the party um, remained intent on sort of, you know, teaching Evola a lesson. So they kept kind of raiding all his uh, residences. And uh, there was a period where he's kind of on the run around it, around Italy from this gang of fascists. Um, and he, uh, on one occasion, he had to leap out of a two-story window uh, to to escape these goons who were coming to lynch him. Um, and uh, the only other note for that year is that he distanced himself from the views expressed in pagan imperialism, which we covered. <laughs> the only thing that disappointed me—I mean, that's a pretty—I didn't know some of those details there that you mentioned. Yeah. The only thing that slightly disappoints me is that he didn't bust out a few magic missiles and fireballs uh, <laughs> <laughs> when he was uh, when he was. Uh, yeah, when he was being chased, but um, yeah, it, it, I think it's probably worth mentioning that um, I I mean anybody who caught the interviews earlier on, um, this is one aspect of Evola's work I have not been able to penetrate at all. The the introduction to magic, it's just that I mean it might as well be double dutch to me. Um, uh, had, like, have you guys got on any better with the introduction to magic? I just I don't have the esoteric background training knowledge to appreciate what's going on there so it just makes no sense to me at all uh um, Frodo, you've got any experience with it well i i don't think that he is uh, and i think john morgan mentioned this in in uh, uh, earlier this evening that it, his books about magic that's it's not a good introduction to magic uh, or to those topics other people who have written about similar topics are far uh, more clear and I don't I don't really know what to make of it um, other than that you know he he wanted he everything uh, if there's one sort of thread that goes through his entire career is that he wanted to reject everything that is sort of uh, uh, that he saw as uh, bourgeois modern world values right and one of those things that goes strictly against the the bourgeois values is of course magic <laughs> so so that's why i think that he he emphasizes and it's also very elitist because very few people can 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 understand or 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 participate in these kinds of things it's very it's something that goes on in uh, closed circles but exactly uh, exactly how he practiced it uh, i think that is um that's probably a mystery uh but he did one of the things he did when he went um 
during the Second World War, when he went to um, uh, to Germany and so on, is that he wanted to find old documents of uh, esoteric secrets, things like. That. So this was a topic that he was interested in, and I thought I think that he also on, uh, saw it as a way to explore sort of the secret history uh, of of what has happened in the sort of in the in the secular world that underneath all of uh, you know, normal history as we see it is something else. He talks about an occult war. And there's this book by Léon de Ponsin uh, where he talks about uh, about the occult war where, you know, uh, he talks about Jews and Freemasonry and such. And uh, Evola, uh, I think he wrote uh, an extensive sort of foreword to the Italian uh, edition. Uh, at least there is mm -hmm. uh, sort of an appendix with an Italian uh, or with uh, Evola's uh, comments about this, and that's also a part of, of some of his other books, uh, this idea of an occult war between the, the, the sort of the evil forces and, and the good forces. Uh, he probably wouldn't use those terms, but, but you know, to convey the idea to the audience that, he, that underneath the things that we see, uh, there is sort of occult forces for good and evil fighting against each other. And I think that the, the magic has, his uh, interest in magic has to be seen in that context. Oh, all right. So, so, so uh, let's carry on. Um, I neglected to mention, actually, um, he also became very well acquainted with um, Corneliu Codrianu um, in Romania. Um, who was the leader of the fascist Iron Guard there. Um, they, he, he spent some time in Romania in the late 20s. Um, but uh, I don't have any more information on that, I'm afraid. Um, although Codrianu would be uh, murdered in 1938 uh, down the road, and that, was, that would be the peak of Evola's uh, anti-Jewish phase. Um, but we'll come on to that. Um, so anyway, yes... Uh, in 1932, we've covered this, but he, he, he well, um, he re-examines Catholicism and he publishes a book that year called The Mask and Face of Contemporary Spiritualism. And in that book, he, um, he, he argues that Catholicism in its modern uh, in, uh, in, incarnation, as it was in the 30s, um, was traditional enough still that it could guide individuals back to kind of true um Catholicism, that if you were driven enough, you could kind of work your way through the more modern aspects and kind of push all the way back to the essence of sort of orthodox uh, Ghibelline uh, Catholic truth. Um, I don't know if Frodi has anything to say about uh, mask and face of contemporary spiritualism. No, uh, I, I actually haven't read that book, um, but I, I wanted to mention uh, about the occult war that Evil actually translated it um into italian and uh so basically he he thought that the subversion of society is is an occult war that's going on and he says that um he says in his foreword one of the great merits of this work is that it emphasizes the metaphysical essence of the revolutionary movement by showing how what uh, how that which is being fought nowadays is not so much a political and social war as a religious one, a battle between supra, uh, between two supranational fronts more than one of the interests of individual nations, races, or parties. Uh, and then it, it goes on and on. So this is, uh, that book is written from a very sort of Catholic point of view. Uh, Léon de Ponsin, uh, of course, uh, wrote it and uh, from that point of view. But yeah, so, so throughout all of these, his ideas uh, about politics and comments about politics, one has to keep in mind that he sees these things not as uh, sort of superficial ideas of uh, individuals, uh, but as forces underneath it, all, uh, underneath it all, underneath history, that there are sort of occult forces at work. Um, so yeah. that's why, of course, he, he had some emphasis on, on magic yeah. and, and those aspects. I, I just have a couple of little notes here. That that book that um, Hat mentioned, The Mask and the Face, is uh, has just been republished by Inner Traditions under the title of The Fall of Spirituality. 
Um, and it's kind of an interesting book because he, uh, in it, Evola basically critiques almost every strand of spirituality that was around then in 1932, like theosophy. Uh, there's a chapter on Satanism in there. He talks about uh, Crowley uh, in there. Um, he has this chapter where he kind of reconsiders Catholicism, as as Hart was saying, and uh, Catholicism, like by the standard, he's pretty scathing about most of the most of the schools he looks at in that book. But uh, Catholicism, I think, gets off, you know, probably the best out of the the ones that you know uh, certainly is uh, that I've seen. Um, so that's the first thing to mention. The second thing to mention uh, about this kind of occult element that you're talking about, Frodo, is, is that um, my understanding is that Gwynon, because long before he went off to become a Sufi, he believed that there was still a kind of an avenue by which uh, Christianity uh, or, you know, uh, esoteric forms of uh, Catholicism even could 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 be the root and as as far as i understand it he basically spent the 20s and maybe even into this into this era in the early 30s um basically like joining all these secret orders secret societies uh you know various strands of masons and so on um and it's only after he goes to them all and finds out that they've basically all been subverted or that they're all you know, they're all affected by pause, essentially. It's only then that he decides to go to um, Egypt. Is that is that right, or am I am I am I incorrect on some of these details? I, I'm I'm not an expert on on Guénon's uh, history, but that was uh, a problem for the the traditionalists, and it's still really a problem because. Uh, one of the criticisms, when I've been very critical of uh, the, the the traditionalists, the capital T traditionalists, in that they've turned um, religion into this sort of almost academic field, this sort of uh, very heavy on theory. Whereas, as I see it, religion, true religion, uh, is 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 pre-literal. It's not it's not something you have to. Re it's it's something that's real, uh, right? And, and mm -hmm. when you, if you turn it into uh, to just sort of theoretical commentary, uh, that's a very modern thing and sort of an anti-religious thing uh, almost. And so. Uh, it's not really a fair criticism of of the actual traditionalist writers, but some of their uh, modern fans have turned it into that, or have just um, sort of followed that aspect of it. Uh, but but of course, I think that all of them uh, agreed that you have to follow s some tradition. You can't just be a, a traditionalist and that's it. Uh, so you have to f try to find an authentic tradition that that you can follow and we should add that traditionalism is a sort of a form of um it's a view of of religion as that behind all the religions be it you know christianity judaism um, islam uh, what we today call hinduism and other <clears throat> other tradition behind all of this is a sort of a general truth that they have in common but they have there are different paths to to uh, finding that truth or following that truth and that can only be found through these traditions so you can't just believe in traditionalism in general and that's it you have to find one of the traditions and actually follow them and i think that was the big challenge for them to find a, a tradition that is genuine and i think that's uh, probably why um Genon ended up uh, in a sufi tradition but yeah that was the tra that was the challenge because in the modern world, all of the traditions have been poisoned. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and the, the reason I brought that up as well, of course, is that they go like he is literally going to secret societies, and so he, or like they, they, the traditionists would have noticed that if there is this quote occult war going on, it would have been going on at that level, at the level of like actual meetings in lodges and so on, you know. Um, but uh, anyway, hat. Do you want to? continue here with our timeline uh yes so um we get to 1934 uh, can either of you tell me what happens in 1934 revolt against the modern world comes out revolt against the modern world hey <laughs> take take a drink if you've got one uh yes revolt against the modern world comes out 
um, to a fairly minor reception, um, as far as I can see. Um, but as, as we've discussed, and I think as was mentioned uh, earlier by some of the other commentators today, um, it's a kind of uh, summary of Evola's entire spiritual conception of the world and, and his entire kind of um, metaphysics summed up as best it can be. Um, it comes out, uh, and that's the end of what I would call Evola's kind of uh, political phase in that respect, in that that was where his attempts to kind of steer the fascist state to a more traditional path began to fizzle, because I, he, I think he began to consider it to be not a, 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 an, an achievable goal. Um, so... I, 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 mean, I think it's probably worth mentioning that... Um, I mean, I, I hate to use terms like blackpilling, but but my understanding is that uh, Gwynon, as much as he was, was an influence on Evola, mm -hmm. uh, was kind of a blackpilling influence. Like I think it was Gwynon's view that the West was just beyond saving entirely. Yeah. And as far as I can tell... Evola came came to this view. Um, you know, I, I don't know if he probably after writing Re Revolt say he didn't he didn't see that there was any any like saving you know saving the West that you you basically have to get to the end of the Kaliuga before before the rebirth can come. If that makes any yeah. sense, so I think that reorientates a lot of his um, a lot of his kind of thinking and energy energies and if that's not true in 1934 it's definitely true like after the second world war right so mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i think yeah. Th this is also connected with you know Genon and uh, and evola supporting different sides you know between the the pope and the the emperor that uh evola was more in support of the path of action right versus Genon more in support of the the path of you know knowledge contemplation uh more sort of a passive um a passive view on things um so, so probably he was more of a black pill <laughs> again on mm -hmm. yes um yeah did, okay let's uh, let's carry on so we're coming to the dawn of the second world war now and um as that begins to kind of heat up um Ev un unlike with the First World War, Evola is kind of un unambiguously pro-Axis from the beginning. Um, and obviously he has many, many deep issues with the regimes in Germany and in, and in Italy. Um, but nonetheless, he sees uh, this as a legitimate fight against uh, liberalism and materialism and uh, all the kind of um, the excesses of the post-revolutionary age. Um, and so when it breaks out eventually, and, in, and of course the Italians join, um, he volunteers to go and fight on the front, um, but was turned down uh, for political reasons. And then something odd happens in that after he's turned down from serving at the front, he basically sort of seems to lose interest in the war almost completely. He, he just sort of ignores it. Like he doesn't he doesn't mention it. He doesn't talk about it. He just seems to ignore it. And he basically just goes to doing kind of freelancing for, for a living. He writes, um, he writes like, uh, uh, travel books, uh, travel articles. He writes like reviews of, of books that have come out. Um, he writes like quite bourgeois tier publications as i mean he, he's, he's also you know continuing to write um like theoretical um uh art articles and essays and things like that um but really we don't have any information other than that he just doesn't seem to take much interest in the war yeah i mean my the, the way i'd pass this era would be a little bit different which is that um in the late 30s he writes these two books on race right the myth of the yeah. blood and the synthesis of the doctrine of race and um i th i mean as far as i can see this is the closest he would get to the to the mussolini's regime like to the point where mussolini um basically wanted evola's view of race to become like the the well yes the, the fascist state's view of race right this um, was the this was the kind of how they they made up so to speak um him and mussolini. yeah so, so 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 that happens in the in the in the late 30s um th then of course uh 
um, you know, you get the kind of sallow rump state, basically. That well, we'll of... we'll get to that. Um, so, so yeah, so he begins to um, uh, do some work for German intelligence a agencies. He's sort of um, certain more um, a academic sects of the of the SS and the Nazi higher up use Evola as their kind of man in Rome. Um, he's, he's frequently in correspondence with several high-ranking uh, SS people. Um, and then, of course, all of a sudden, in 1943, um, there's a coup, Mussolini yeah. is forced out, and the king and General Badoglio um, basically de de declare an armistice with the Allies. Um, and you have a, si a situation then in which half of Italy is now on the Allied side of the war, and the other half is on the Axis side of the war. Um, and it, so you essentially have a kind of Italian civil war in in in, in the context of all this. Um, and so at first, Evola is in Rome, and Rome was pretty much immediately in German hands. Um, there was, you know, there was an attempt for uh, troops loyal to the new government under the king to secure it, but it didn't go through, and the Germans under uh, Kesselring, I believe, swept in. Um, and there's so several high-ranking members of the SS sent him cables telling him to come back to to, to, to Germany, um, where he'd been giving some lectures and, and giving talks and things. And um, he's reluctant to because he hopes that there's this thing called the fascist plot, um, which is an attempt to overthrow the government in the south. Uh, however, this this is essentially it, 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 it doesn't exist, and um, he's he has to leave. Um, so he so now this period is where it gets incredibly schizophrenic um a lot of this is going to sound very odd i'm probably going to mess up some dates and things but this is just from me trying to piece together what i can glean from various uh, sources uh, mm -hmm. on this part of Evelyn's life so on september the 9th 1943 uh Evola is flown to hitler's headquarters at rastenburg which is now in poland um wow. hitler is not there what this is, is a meeting of uh, high-ranking kind of Italian intellectuals, uh, kind of propagandists, journalists, etc. And um, they're all kind of summoned to this uh, this headquarters in, in East Prussia. And uh, they're, they're kind of hot, they're, they're, they're holed up for a week in this railway car. And uh, they're addressed suddenly by Joachim von Ribbentrop, the famous uh, foreign, foreign, foreign minister of the Reich. Um, and he kind of gives them a speech where he says, uh, you are to immediately draft a proclamation to the Italian people saying, you know, those of you still loyal to Mussolini, we must fight on, you know, the war, the war is not lost, etc. Um, and of course, right around that time, Mussolini is rescued in a daring raid by the commando, uh, Otto Scorzini. Um, and, uh, Mussolini is kind of brought along to meet Hitler. And then he ends up meeting, uh, Evola and these intellectuals as well. Um, so Evola doesn't really isn't really that on board with this propaganda plan, and he he does contribute to it, but he ends up um, um, having a meeting with Mussolini uh, and all these others. But he basically rejects Mussolini at that point. He says, you know, um, Mussolini is just re re he's he's returning to his old like socialist um, fantasies when he was a young man. He's lost all sense of tradition. He's he doesn't know what he's doing anymore. So this is not for me. Um, so, and, uh, he, he has a conversation with, uh, with, with, with Mussolini in which he kind of points out to Mussolini, you know, there's, uh, there's, we don't have a fleet anymore. We don't have an army anymore. You know, what, what are you going to do? And Mus Mus Mussolini is convinced that Hitler has these wonder weapons that are going to win, that are t turn the war around and win it. Um, and he's Mussolini still, still willing to put up a fight in that regard. So, you know, as you know, he's sent to the North of Italy where he sets up the, um, sallow uh uh mm -hmm. administration um and evola goes back to rome um but the trouble is that as soon as evola is back in rome and begins to work on his uh books and things again the german chief commander kesselring declares that they're going to abandon rome and move back to the what's the name of the line uh they had a name for it. There was a line of sort of uh, trenches and forts and things north of Rome they were going to move back to. And um, they ended up going 
straight back there uh, almost immediately. And it was so short notice and the Allied troops were advancing so fast. And Evelyn knew that, that if he stayed there, he would probably be uh, uh, imprisoned or killed by the Allies. So he packs one cardboard suitcase. Um, and he doesn't pack clothes. He doesn't pack food or you know stuff to wash with or any kind of traveling um, necessity. This suitcase is instead stuffed to the brim with notes, proofs, and drafts, and typed up pages for his book, Introduction to Magic, um, which he considered to be of the utmost importance. That was all he took with him. It was the clothes he had on his back and a suitcase full of notes for Introduction to Magic. Um, and he didn't, he didn't have a car. He didn't have a train. He walked for three days. He walked to the north of Rome um, to join up with these the, the retreating German troops. Uh, he just he just he just walked. Um, and um, the interesting thing is that there are three routes he would have taken. Um, would have been the Aurelia, the Cassia, or the Flaminia, the um, consular roads of Italy. And uh, a lot around almost exactly the same time in exactly the same place. A certain Ezra Pound was also wandering north, uh, <laughs> fleeing the advance of the Allied troops. Um, so it's it's entirely possible that they would have rubbed shoulders at some point, though I don't think they would have uh, uh, known each other. Wow, I, I didn't know any of these details. Yeah, um, yeah. It, I mean, I I will mention that in that interview that you can watch, um, uh, Evelyn basically disavows Mustache Man. But says that he did have dealings with Himmler, um, yes. specifically around this idea of resurrecting like Teutonic Knights, Black Order, or something. He Is admired like... he admired Himmler's um, appreciation for certain magical forms of tradition, um, and his willingness to indulge in certain occult uh, means of of winning the the spiritual war, basically that was being fought alongside the military one. Um, I mean, he considered himself an ally of Himmler in the war against uh, liberalism, I think. <clears throat> Though I think um, Fro Fro Frody will know more uh, than I will on this. Yeah, he was. Um, uh, he, he respected the SS. He liked the SS because the SS was formed as an order. And he thought that the state should be or the yeah the, it should be led by an order a sacred order devoted to uh, to an idea so he was very that that idea very much appealed to him but then he had some um some disagreements and uh, some disagreements with national socialism with the ss and uh the ss also uh made a statement saying that Evola is a reactionary dreamer and a dilettante of the old upper class. And they saw him as uh, perhaps not a threat, but, but definitely not. He wasn't helping with his, his uh, eccentric mm -hmm. ideas. Um, they had their own ideology and, uh, you know, he, he tried to sort of, uh, preach his own ideas and uh, that wasn't very appreciated by the ss so they they had some sort of you know secret documents on evola uh, which were sort of they sort of dismissed him as an eccentric crank basically yeah but I, i'm i'm led to believe that during this period you know 43 to 45 um unless you guys know any different um he did do a little bit of archival work like every once in a while like you know, some SS dude or Himmler well, want to know some little bit of occultist detail, and Evola would dig it up for them and send it. Send yes, it away, sort of thing. he was. He yeah. was. He was doing ar archival work, um, and this leads us on to why, of course, Evola then ends up in Vienna. Um, now, it's generally thought, it's generally assumed that he's in Vienna um, to do archival work for the SS, as you said. But the actual answer is we don't know why Evola went to Vienna. Um, now, this must have been important because his trip to Vienna, when he arrived in, 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 that, in that city, not only was it under something like 10 air raids a day from the Russian uh, the Air Force, 
but it was within the artillery range of, of the Russian guns. It was it was under constant uh, shelling. It was under um, it, it was it was under siege essentially, um, and there was a brutal fight to hold it against the Russians that was being fought at the time when he arrived. But nevertheless, he went and was doing some kind of um, academic work, as you say. Um, it's not clear if it was uh, an, an archive for the SS, but it may well have been. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, you have this famous incident that leads to his being paralyzed, um, where he is out walking in Vienna, um, and he is paralyzed. Now, thanks to Gianfranco de Torres, we have a very complete account of what actually happened. Um, and his apartment, it's, it's quite strange. So it's quite late at night and he leaves his apartment to basically, it seems just for no other reason than to go for a walk. Um, and while he's out walking, his apartment is actually hit by a bomb. So if he had stayed in, he would have been killed. Um, but instead he goes out in this, in this air raid and a, a, a bomb lands nearby when he's walking through this square and the blast blows him against um, a piece of scaffolding that is um, that is up against a wall, and it hits his lower back, right on his lower back, and he's knocked unconscious by this. And um, shortly after, some uh, some local workmen see him lying there, and they they come running over and, and ask him what had happened. And the interesting th thing is, he was not he didn't seem to be injured at all. Um, there was no broken skin his clothes are all still intact um he was just dazed and the the, the first thing he, he he said to these men when he when he woke up is has it have any of you seen my monocle um because it had gone missing <laughs> in this in this blast um oh, yeah. and um then of course he was taken to hospital and it was discovered that he had some very serious damage to his, his spinal cord um and he was basically quickly losing the 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 use of his legs um and he's been invalid for the rest of the war, then, basically. And for the rest of his life, right? Well, uh, well. For, so this is quite complicated. So the nature of this injury is basically that he's not completely a, a write-off case, in a sense. There's, there's a chance that he could learn to walk again. The trouble is that right after that injury, he's taken to hospital in a, in a, in a war zone. You know, this is not like... This is not an upscale hospital where they can get the best treatment available to him. This is, you know, people are being dragged in off the street with limbs having been, you know, blown off from bombs and bullet wounds. And I mean, the first thing that happens is he's brought out of uh, Vienna, so he won't be he won't be um, captured by the communists. Um, and he's sent, I believe, to Milan, um, where he is then treated. Um, and the interesting thing is that despite being in enormous pain from this injury and despite being in a basically a wreck of a, of a physical state, having been, you know, dragged from from Vienna to, to Milan in a couple of days and not really having been treated. Um, so back in those days, most hospital wards had a typewriter or some kind of writing equipment in them so that uh, patients in them could quickly write correspondence home or to their family and friends. So they tell them what had happened to him if that ended up in hospital. Um, and the first thing he did upon being dumped in this ward, you know, as, as I say, enormous pain, lost the use of his legs, he'd been in a bomb accident. Um, he just goes over to this typewriter and starts working on a bunch of essays <laughs> for, his, for his next book. Um, just immediately, he sort of hogs this typewriter in the ward. Um, he just, yeah, he, I mean, he never stops. I, I think it's worth mentioning that it's kind of interesting that it's during this period that he produces... Uh, arguably his two most I mean I say I hesitate to say most spiritual but you know it, he, he it's doctrine of the awakening and the yoga of power yeah uh, 1943 and then 1949 are the publication date so the beginning and the I mean 1949 is a bit you know I'm guessing he was working on that if he was working on anything because uh, uh, it's interesting uh, yeah yeah go, go ahead no I, I, uh, I, it, During I'm this sorry, I just to, time, I, I, okay, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, Freddie, I'll just mention really, really quickly. Uh, yeah. The Ogre of Power was actually a book that he wrote in 1925 originally, um, but he he redrafted it uh, at some point around around this time. So um, I'm guessing he was working on that. Anyway, carry on, Freddie. Yeah. 
No, it's funny that in um, he was staying in Budapest for a while um, in, in Hungary because there was some specialist doctor there uh, that that you know uh, that was a specialist in the injuries that uh, that Ebola had, and uh, I went to to see the place where he lived, the address, and right now there is. Uh, there's there's not an apartment there. There's some sort of Italian lingerie shop. <laughs> but I went to the address that Evola was staying at when he was in Budapest once when I visited it uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so, yeah, he did travel around a, a bit. But I just wanted to add as well uh, that in 1938, um, Himmler gave uh, uh, Willigut. Uh, so Willigut is Himmler's sort of occult guy the guy who designed the ss uh, death's head ring and who was sort of the the, the sort of the, the occult uh, inspiration or or uh, sort of guide for uh, Wevelsburg, their sort of order castle and uh, he got the task to investigate evola because evola had given a lecture in 1938 in germany uh, about his theories about race and uh, they needed to find out what uh, what these theories were about and and whether they should allow it or not so uh, uh, and this this sort of the report that Willigut wrote uh, to directly to Himmler uh, we have that and there's it's available online uh, as a translation of it and basically they saw him as uh, as as an interesting eccentric but uh, with sort of weird ideas that could be divisive, uh, but it's it's interesting that 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 Himmler sent his sort of occult guy to investigate Evola. So there was like a lot of weird stuff going on, uh, sort of beneath the surface. So so what happens now, Ham? Um, so interestingly, so you know I mentioned his older brother um, at the start of the stream. Mm -hmm. Well. He begins to write letters. He, 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 I think this, um, him being in that, that bomb attack had some uh, effect on him personally. And he, he wrote letters to Gwenom. Um, he wrote letters to his brother and he wrote letters to his mother, among other people. Um, and in fact, the letter, the, re the reply he received from Gwenom was very interesting because Gwenom read the account of what had happened and he said, I think what has happened to you is a curse. It's a psychological thing, not a physical thing. Because apparently Gwenon had had, had been um, paralyzed for six, month, six months due to a curse somebody in Egypt had, had, had put on him. And this, paral this, this paralysis was lifted when somebody hunted down the man and killed him um, to end this, this curse of, of paralysis. Um, so Gwenon was basically saying to Evola, "Look, I think I think you've actually been cursed. Um, some somebody has put an evil eye on you." Uh, so that was uh, rather rather interesting. Um, yeah. He, yeah, he... It sounds really weird. Like uh, I wonder what the. <laughs> I mean, I, I I shouldn't say I wonder what the actual medical explanation was. Maybe I, I, maybe I they mean... were right. Maybe maybe there was some occultist metaphysical evil attack. Eye. Going on, yeah. Well, I think so. Um, and uh, Evola also complained ceaselessly about the medical staff and the doctors. Um, apparently, these doctors knew very well who he was, what he was doing, and why he was there. Um, and they just annoyed him to no end. Um, and uh, he is so interestingly, um. He moves back with his mother after a while, who he'd been estranged from, but who he'd kind of made up with in this period. Uh, and then there's a some point at which um, there's there's some strange incident where American troops after the war ends, American troops in occupied in occupied uh, Rome come looking for him, um, and the Casa Evola, the apartment in Rome where his family owned and where he lived um, has a very, has a particular layout and these, so two American kind of GIs came around the house and they kind of went in and talked to the mother asking where he was. 
Little did they know he was in the cupboard right behind the door when they came in, um, <laughs> tucked away in there. <laughs> um, and they just never thought to check. Um, and then they left and his mother kind of well, dragged him out of the cupboard. But he couldn't walk at that point. How the hell did he get in there? Well, no, but this is he, he was he was in his he was in he was on uh, he was either on crutches or in a wheelchair. Um, oh right, okay. And so he kind of had to be like literally stuffed into this cupboard to avoid these you know, American troops. You know, that's very that's very funny because like I mean I don't know why you look like it at that time, but Evola when he's a little bit older does start to look a bit like Dracula. So the idea of him like he does being in the, in the cupboard, cupboard is kind you of you open funny. the cupboard and he's in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Anything? Anything else? Uh... Anything else in this period? Or? I'm, just, I'm just checking notes because, as I say, it's a very schizophrenic bit of time for Evola. Um, I'm trying to think when he starts writing again because uh, he's he's discharged in 1948 officially, um, and he's still writing in this period. He's still working on books. He's still corresponding with friends and with Rene Guénon in Egypt. Um, uh, oh yes, this of course now. Uh, what happens now is that so one so we, we we get to 1950 and immediately in the post-war there are neo-fascist groups which spring up in quite large numbers um, seeking to avenge the, um, the, the the betrayal they call it um, they want to kind of restore the fascist rule to power and despite having been an enemy of the fascists for most of his time the uh, most of the time he was around them Evola is seen as a kind of almost like a god to these to these uh, many young men. Probably because the young men themselves weren't really around in the thirties that you know that well um, when uh, when this was happening. And so there's all these kind of young, sort of quite intellectual, but quite violent young chaps who go to visit Evola. And you know he it, it is a bit sort of. Uh, Dracula-like, I suppose, this kind of crippled old man in a wheelchair who lives in an attic in Rome, and they all they all go up there at night to talk to him about you know mystic sub subjects and uh, you know how 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 to how to fight uh, how to fight communism and fight liberalism and all this sort of thing. Um, but uh, what then happens is that because of his association with these young men and their kind of neo-fascist groups, um, he is arrested. And he is put on trial as a neo-fascist encouraging terror. Um, and this was a fairly major trial. Um, I don't know how well how well known Evola would have been in those years following the war, but the trial itself became quite um, quite important. Um, and he was defended by um, a well-known professor, a law professor whose name I can't find now. Um, but in any case, yes, he was put on trial. And this is where the famous um, super fascist uh, thing comes from. He, of course, I, I should say this: this trial itself, he was he was carried into the courtroom. There, 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 there were so many invalids post-war in Italy that there were no wheelchairs available. So he was carried into the courtroom on a litter by four young fascist lads um, and kind of laid down in the dock. Um, and then he kind of screwed in his monocle and, and, and started this long, long monologue of self-defense. Um, and apparently he spoke extremely uh, eloquently. And, as, you know, as, as I say, he, he, he called himself a super fascist, literally above uh, fascism. And um, he was acquitted completely um, and never faced legal trouble again from the Italian state. Uh, yeah, so, I, mean, I, I think that, I mean, I, I think the gist of his def defense was, it was something along the lines of what I believe is what any normal person would have believed before yeah. 1778 or something. He's, like he's basically saying, I'm a reactionary, not a, not a fascist. Um, is, is, he, is, is, I, I've read that. He, I think he, he, he evokes uh, De Maestra during that defense as well. He, he fact, does. It's actually well worth reading that. Uh, it is. That defense. It's, a, it's an interesting document in its own right. Uh, yeah. And um, just, just in terms of his, if you have that Arctos book, uh, a handbook for right wing youth, um, you can see that he didn't exactly shy away from this mantle as a as a kind of mental figure to the youth. Uh, he, you know, all through the fifties, he's 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 obviously writing for this new audience that he's got, trying to give them guidance and trying to keep them on the the right. And it's kind of a it's an interesting. Um, there's some interesting stuff on like how can I say like organization and things as, as well. So like 
He's there literally is. talking about like uh, you know all the stuff that people still deal with: petty dramas, discipline. You know uh, yeah. what you do. You know when I talked about keeping Security standards spirals. And, yeah. and, and things like that, uh, maintaining like good standards. You know, not having just like. And, and he recognizes that a lot of people who find themselves on that side of politics are kind of like disaffected in some way, you know, or they they haven't got their lives together and things like that. So it, it's kind of interesting, uh, some interesting advice from Evelyn in that in that particular book. Um, I should also mention, uh, and again, I, I don't know if Frody knows more about this, but I am led to believe, I can't remember where I read it, but after the war, Evelyn did seek to get in touch with some of his old buddies like i think he tried to track down ernst younger didn't he uh or at least like try to write to him or find out what he was doing and you know he does make an active effort to try to maintain a kind of intellectual network of you know quote unquote bad old nazis not not that younger was an art you know what i'm saying like kind of hmm. people who would have been associated with um you know the, the, the fascists in italy or the, or the or the germans in you know the, the mid-century Germans. Uh, I, I don't know if he tries to write to Carl Schmidt, but like I, I'm just saying, there's an intellectual me milieu out there, and uh, I, I seem to remember reading somewhere that he did make an active effort to get in touch with people. Hmm. Yeah, there was. Uh, I mean, there, there are several post-war intellectuals that were um, sort of influenced by his ideas, and especially in uh, in the realm of religion, a person like uh, Eliade, uh, who at one point was a member of Codriano's Iron Guard, I believe. Uh, when he was young, he went on to become probably one of the one of the most prominent religious scholars uh, of the last century. He referred to Evola and, and mentioned him and uh, was definitely influenced by his ideas on comparative religion and so on. So he did... Uh, he was in touch with other intellectuals, and other intellectuals acknowledged their sort of debt to him. Yeah, can I just ask a quick question uh, here? Is it kind of a, slightly unrelated to Evola, but also related to Evola? Uh, how is it that Carl Schmitt and Heidegger were like literally card carrying members of the Nazi Party, and yet they're studied in universities, you know? Because like they were on, important like, enough. Um, but but Evola gets all of this all of this nonsense, even though he was never a member of the fascist party. Like, how does that work? I don't understand well, why. It's it's basically because the establishment has chosen it to be so. I mean, the thing about Heidegger is his imprint on continental um, philosophy and, and European ph philosophy in his own lifetime was so immense. Like the the, the things he said were so ground breaking for the scene at the time you simply it doesn't matter if he was a nazi you, you can't ignore him um you you have to teach him as part of the um the uh the canon you know every, every university student of philosophy will learn who heidegger was um i i, I think honestly it's more to do with that than anything else because because i mean evola is such a specific strand of thought that is so antithetical to the uh modern philosophical fashion that they wouldn't want to teach him anyway because they they can they can kind of spin heidegger in their own way whereas with evola you couldn't do that um i think that's yeah, why if I, I remember how heidegger was taught to me in university which is that um the uh the professor at the start of the lesson just said listen whatever i'm about to tell you just remember and then he had a, like a picture of heidegger in a uniform or whatever um you know he was a card carry yeah. member of the Nazi party. I was disavowed. I was also, about, about, I was also yeah. taught about yeah. Heidegger in university in the same way. It was just remember, Ed, before I tell you what, what I'm going to tell you, major Nazi, this guy, so be careful. Yeah. But also, uh, Evola wasn't an academic. I mean, the other, Schmidt and uh, Heidegger were professors and they, they wrote in a, an academic style. Uh, sort of a footnoted style <laughs> or, or whatever you want to call it. But Evola was sort of an independent, eccentric intellectual. I don't really know where he would fit in uh, in academic. Uh, yeah, I mean, quite right. What, what course would you? What course would you yeah. teach? Uh, like, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, I mean, so so the, I don't really know where they would put him, uh, and and also, uh, Evola wrote in a very. 
a sort of a poetic style almost like Nietzsche he proclaims he doesn't argue very much right and, and so so there is there there are some sort of obstacles to to putting him in academia yeah he doesn't do, i mean Evola doesn't do much of like uh, well on the one hand this and then this guy argues right. that and then you know <laughs> um, he doesn't yeah. do much of that sort of stuff at all whereas even uh, i mean i have some i had my uh, my copy of uh, the Sovereign Collection of Schmidt arrived this morning. Actually, uh, you can see Schmidt doing a lot more of that sort of stuff because he, you know, is a bit more establishment. Okay, sh shall we carry on then? Where have we got to? Like 1950. Well, I mean, yeah. from then on. So of course, you know, he he, he writes uh, Men Amongst the Ruins. He writes Ride the Tiger much later on, and then right at the end of his life, before he dies, he publishes um, Path of Cinnabar. Those are the main works. Um, I'm probably missing some things out there, though. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I've got... Um, so there's the Doctrine Awakening and Yoga of Power in the 40s. Um, obviously, during this period, he didn't publish that much uh, in terms of actual books, maybe for obvious reasons. Um, yes. Um, uh, but he did. He, he was still writing in for, like, newspapers, magazines. He never journals, stopped writing. In the 40s, um, right? He, I, I think, he, honestly, he was compulsive in that respect. He couldn't stop writing. You know, like that story I told you about about the hospital ward, he, he couldn't stop at any point. Mm -hmm. If he had work to do, he had to do it. Um, and he uh, he kind of, as, as I say, he became this kind of mystic type guy who lived up in this, this attic um, in Rome. And he was he supported himself off of an invalid's war pension he got from the state um because of his injury uh and he, he just lived like that and he you know quite 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 modest means and um as I say, all these fascist youth and kind of right wing youth would go up to this attic and like you know they'd just come and sort of knock on the door and there'd be a maid there and she'd sh sh show them in and he'd be there in his room and they'd all go and sit around and talk to him um and um, there's a very fascinating book, which I recommend ev everybody read, called Julius Evola, Sufi of Rome. And mm. it's written by somebody who knew Evola right at the end of his life in this period when a lot of the fascist youth actually felt kind of Evola was a bit out of fashion by then. And this one guy was kind of like the last person that was regularly, you know, going up there to see him. Um and uh, kind of t just relates all these these conversations and anecdotes he had with Evola. Um, and there are so many just fascinating little bits about his life in there, um, including one very interesting thing I stumbled upon only the other week, that Evola may have offspring out there. Um, because according to this book, Evola had a son. Um, and I will, I will elucidate. It says, uh, for no reason at all, Evola showed me a letter. The envelope looked old and torn. It bore a foreign stamp. It had reached him in Rome after the war, he said. It was from a woman he had met in Germany. After the war, she had migrated to Argentina. Later, she had written to him to let him know she had a child from him. She called him Hector. Evola says, when I first received this letter, it did not please me at all. Indeed, it irritated me. How could I be sure the child was mine? The relationship we had was brief. I wished she had got rid of him somehow. Anyway, she never wrote again, and I never gave the matter a second thought. He looked hard at me. I do not know what he expected me to say. Um, and then it goes on. Uh, One of the reasons I admired Evola was that he kept aloof from the patriarchal style of life, wife and brood of children, then so typical of Italians. Before I could think of anything to say, however, he put the letter away and went back to talking about Ma Malaparte's last book. He never mentioned the lost son again. But I did put two and two t together. Well, I tried to. His evident emotions in relating the story of Caspar Hauser, the abandoned unhappy boy that suggested some inner chord had been struck. Was it that Caspar reminded him of his own son, a fatherless, solitary lad wandering in some dreary Latin American town or in the pampas and the guilt issuing from it? I shall never know. Uh, he, now, he was a pretty mysterious character when it came to his private life um yes. in that interview the, the the french dude asks him you never got married you never had any you never had any family 
and um, he he basically says like, uh, you know, I I I'm base I'm anti bourgeois to the core, and then he says, oh, and by the way, I'm against monogamy, <laughs> which is just like uh, you know, just by the by, um, as we probably should have mentioned, the major book he brought out um, in this period was uh, Eros and the Mysteries of Love. Um, and and it, it, interestingly, in in the path of Cinnabar, um, he says, like, I mean, any of us would say, what are his major books in this period? Well, Men Among the Ruins and Ride the Tiger. But he seems to consider Eros and the Mysteries of Love the most important book he wrote in this time yes. after the war. Uh, and I find that I just found it interesting that in his own estimation, that was the most important book. So. I just, I just, before I talk, I have to say, <laughs> glance down at the chat. They're all saying we need to go and find Hector Evola. <laughs> <laughs> Hector <laughs> Evola, right. Hector Evola, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. But yes. So, but I, I think that's like, how can I put this? Um, this is quite like, we're talking about quite a radical person here. Um, very few people opt out of uh, quote unquote bourgeois life to that degree where, you know, that not only do they forswear getting married, but they also like, you know, swear off monogamy. I mean, this is quite a unconventional figure to to be seen as like, a, you know, I mean, I guess you'd say he's a, radi a radical reactionary, but he's also like not conservative in, in any way that you might imagine. You know, um, it, it, just in terms of this radical individual freedom that he he never gives up on, uh, and this is like, I mean, I, mean, I think if you you know if you get down to his justifications for it, it comes down to uh, you know, I mean, it, you, you said at the start of the stream he was kind of uh, against like Nietzsche's idea of the of the Ubermensch, but there is a, there is a kind of aristocratic master morality in this idea of like well you know marriage and monogamy that's going to be for a plebe and it's not for me it's too too much for me to give up my own my like uh, my own dedication to what what i want to do uh mm -hmm. you know having a wife and kids would have uh tied me down basically so yes um, yeah um i mean with eveler himself it's kind of difficult to say um exactly what he did i mean honestly reading the um sufi of rome book he 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 did kind of almost descend into Kuma ter territory at times um, when it came to women. I mean, he did seem. I mean, he was not he was not prudish when it came to uh, uh, lust, shall we say? Um, but I mean, in in Eros, he basically makes the case that there are no true women left. That you know, the 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 type of woman that would have been the archetypical traditional woman just doesn't exist. They've all been consumed by the pause. Um, so you know, I think that was that was his uh, stated reason. Um, it's thought that he did have a relationship in his early twenties with a woman, uh, a Russian emigre, I believe, but I can't remember what her name was. Um, and he wrote a poem for her, which I was reading the other day, but I can't I can't think of it now. Um, but yes, he. I just think he was so keen to not live a kind of bourgeois life he just was never going to have kids in, in a marriage it just wasn't for him he was in many ways uh, a sort of a paradoxical character because well as we've said he was uh, a dadaist i mean he he was both mm -hmm. anti-modern and hyper-modern at the same time both anti-bourgeois and very bourgeois many of the, the these things these sort of uh the eccentric writer it's sort of a bourgeois thing i mean it, it, in in a harsher time when <laughs> when when uh, our people were on the rise rather than sort of lazy uh uh fat and and weak that's not really the the, the type of of person you'd have you would have people more dedicated to the people more dedicated to to uh, not their own sort of eccentric proclivities and uh, he, he disliked Wagner, but he liked the jazz. And, and he also had um, some sympathy for Kalergi. I mean, this, <laughs> who, everyone today knows who Count Kalergi uh, was, right? Yeah. And, and Evola even had some sympathies for him. 
Uh, and so there, there are some, some sort of, uh, and that's another reason why it's difficult to pigeonhole him as uh, belonging in this or that political camp. Uh, because he had these weird eccentric things about almost everything. And, I, I, yeah, and th I, I, that's something that should be kept in mind. And there was, with respect to Kalergi, there was also, uh, this is also something that sort of separates the fascists from national socialists. There were fascists who were sympathetic to that idea and to, to um, Kalergi, but the national socialists were very much opposed to him. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention very quickly... Um... I mean, he does have some rather choice words to say about jazz in several essays and Bowen the yes. Pope, Um I think he calls it. Uh, he, he always call, like he he calls it howler. He calls the singers howlers. I don't think that's an Italian thing, but um, I I don't know. He he sees it as a he sees it as a as a kind of uh, uh, Jewish Negro music essentially. Yes. Um, he, so, he says that yeah. it's it, it's not that he. Like he accepts it when it's in its place as kind of Negro music, but he found that distasteful that all these kind of genuinely talented composers and musicians were playing it because it wasn't it wasn't for them. You know, they they should have been looking for something higher than kind of low born Negro music. Um, was his opinion? Yes. Uh, so also, so yeah yeah. Also, um, you mentioned uh, uh, Eros and uh, Met. Uh, metaphysics of sex and uh, Evola and kind of women. Um, if it wouldn't take up too much time, I just want to read one more extract from this book just to illustrate something to the audience. Um, okay. Evola and women. <laughs> so it says, Evola's writings had somehow gained him a reputation for being a misogynist. Actually, that was totally unwarranted. When much later I fully digested metaphysics of sex, perhaps his finest book, I realized how deeply woman-friendly the Baron actually was. Indeed, it can be said that he brought the feminine into the very heart of God. Back then, it took me a while to bring myself to ask him whether a girlfriend of mine, Maria, could come along to see him. Not that I liked the idea, but Maria had insisted. She had grown suspicious, even jealous of this mysterious character I regularly went, went to visit in the night. Besides, she was left-wing. I expected Evola to be chilly, perhaps to cold shoulder her, but nothing of the kind. The first thing he did was get up and kiss her hand. As he was crippled and he could not get up from his chair, he begged Maria to come closer, and then with a flourish, he bestowed a kiss. Not only that, he became quite fl flirtatious, paying her compliments and making suggestive jokes. Can I have a telephone number, he asked. Like Disraeli with Queen Victoria, he certainly knew how to carry some favour with a woman. Maria, leftist or not, was charmed. Not that she could make any sense of what our host was saying. In that, Evelyn was a bit mischievous. Having shown his perfect manners with a lady, he embarked on a long disquisition on Hegelian philosophy. Too much for both of us. So when the doorbell rang and Evola profusely apologized, he was obliged to receive somebody else. We felt relief. We thanked him and left. Strange but wonderful man, Maria said as we walked downstairs. But his monocle, that's a bit funny, isn't it? He only wore it for you, I said. My girl looked really chuffed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there we go. Yeah, he does. I mean, he does... He does come back to the idea of, um, as I mean, in in this book, the metaphysics of sex, he, he does suggest that sex is one of the ways that you can that you can find, uh, you know, liberation. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a it's a left hand it's a left uh, left hand path available uh, to you, um, and he does get into some pretty uncomfortable uh, territory in that book where. You know, I mean, obviously, leftists uh, take these things out of context. Um, uh, you know, but there's there's like one passage where he's saying like the the encounter between the man and the woman should have, should have almost this element of danger, possibly almost of like, you know, something something slightly slightly rapey about it. Um, yeah, you understand what he's trying to say, right? But um, these are things that are kind of like beyond the pale these days. Even even though he is getting. He's getting at something uh, almost primordial about about sex um, and the encounter between the absolute male and the absolute female. Uh, so, yes. uh, yeah. Well, his his conception, of, as, as you discussed with um, with Kat earlier, the, the conception of the woman in Evola's is Evola's works is that as a as a being which is superior when she gives herself up to a man as as a lord, basically. Um, 
and that has to also be reflected in sex, according to Evelyn. Yeah. Um, any uh, any other comments about this uh, late part? I mean, the, the thing is, is that most of the uh, the writings that we have from Arctos, um, you know, in in the collections, you know, recognitions and bow in the club and uh, it, most of them, if you have a look, were written after the war. But like a lot of the, there's, there's the occasional essay from the 40s and the 30s, but a lot of it was kind of late. Uh, as far as I can see, a lot of it was 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 late Evola, um in terms of the essays that we have. That, yeah. that there's that collection East and West. Uh, they were all in the 1950s. I mean, he never stopped writing. Uh, well, he he saw it as his job to to. I mean, in in a sense, he was the last sort of being of that time when there was a kind of open warfare against liberalism in Europe. You know, you had mm. Mussolini, you had Franco, you had Hitler. You know, and even though these they, these men all came from radically different intellectual currents, you even had Stalin, of course. Um, and even though these men came from radically different intellectual currents and and different forms of metaphysics. They were all fundamentally opposed to liberal capitalism, um, and there was that. You know, you if you if you were opposed to it too, you had to kind of pick up the bunch almost. You know, if you were a reactionary Catholic, you'd be with Franco. If you were a communist, you'd be with Stalin. If you were a, a fascist, you'd be with Mussolini. And if you were a Nazi, you'd be with Hitler. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's the, 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 these were your open forms of warfare, and and of course, Evola was the one that lived through this phase in which. All of a sudden, that all went away in one fell swoop. Almost, it was gone, um, and we were now stuck with this. This, you know, your options are now liberalism or communism, and for him, those are two sides of the same coin. So, um, yeah, just just before I hit some super chats, I mean, one of the big, I think, one of the major themes that has come out of the stuff that we've talked about all day, you know, the interviews, the videos, uh, etc., and this stream is. Um, is really Evola's view that, uh, you know, the enemy, quote unquote, of tradition is as much America as it was, as it was the Bolsheviks and the, the Russians and the communists and so on, yeah. well, if not was, more so. Um, yeah, he, and, and, he had a very funny uh, comment about America in one of his essays. <laughs> he said that um, America disproves uh, Rene Descartes' sort of maxim that I think, therefore I am, because Americans don't think, but yet they exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and and I, but I, I do think that, you know, there's many aspects of his of his work that is uh, interesting as we've explored all day, but I think, like for us now, the 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 analysis of liberalism as being this dissolving this this force that uh, must dissolve tradition and must have this downwards trajectory you know to you know more and more Kali Yuga more and more more and more almost like demonic and abyssal um as we as we continue downwards um I think is one of the more important uh lessons from him because you know I still talk to people who think like the great enemy is communism the great enemy is like oh it's it's, it's subversion from Moscow oh, it's, uh, you know, all of this kind of Cold War rhetoric, uh, you know, you've got to, got to know who the real enemy is. You know, it's still, still battling against the Frankfurt School. Um, yeah, all of these things, all of these things may be there, but the the fundamental logic of liberal democracy gets us here. Communism or no communism, Frankfurt School or no Frankfurt School, it, it leads downwards. Um and uh, I mean, you, you know, there's a crossover with other with other thinkers here. And you know, we mentioned Carlyle uh, also had this uh, this view of democracy as this demonic leveling force. Um, but I, I just find it interesting how how prescient many of his his writings on this issue are when read from the vantage point of you know 40, 50 years later. Um, you know, and that, that that suggests to me he was onto like he's onto something uh, true. You know, we talk about uh, the absolute and you know uh, perennial truths. Uh, this seems to be the case, right? That we, you know, the the revolt of uh, liberal democracy is some some sort of revolt against the natural order of things. Any mm. thoughts, Rody? Well, I could add some things. I uh, I have some um, some notes here. It seems that. Um, 
uh, and I want to echo what John Morgan said that um, it's sort of unfortunate that Ebola is, is known today mostly probably as a political thinker, but that's the least interesting aspect of him. Uh, and that's also where he was you know, somewhat confused. He had weird things to say about politics, which, uh, which were somewhat sort of bourgeois and just eccentric. Uh, he criticized uh, both the, the, uh, the fascists and the national socialists for being mass movements, for example. And uh, I mean, you can think what you like about fascism, but <laughs> what were they supposed to do? I mean, the, the only alternative to being a mass movement in that time was to be politically irrelevant. Uh, so, so this, uh, he, he had these sort of very, the ex this, this sort of eccentric artist and eccentric intellectual was sort of at the core of, of many of the things he did. Uh, so I don't think that he is that he deserves a, a, a position as some sort of guru figure. I think that he wrote, he had some good insights and some bad insights. And I think that probably the best aspects of his intellectual uh, production and his intellectual career is um, his criticism of the left, which is brilliant. His uh, sort of, his ideas about existentialism and the, the uh, how to survive as, um, as, Sort of an alienated person in this modern bourgeois world he had some brilliant ideas about that some va very uh, valid insights into uh religious issues and that's also where he's been recognized by authorities such as um such as um uh, eliad for example uh so so i think that people need to be aware of that and also when i talk to italians um he doesn't seem to have that same status among the Italian right uh, as he does in the sort of the Anglophone right in the last couple of decades. Um, so people should be aware of that. And one thing that he really adds that I think is, uh, is very valuable is that sometimes you'll see people in the modern world or in the current year, criticize, for example, mass immigration or other kinds of policies because they're bad for the economy uh, or because uh, of, of IQ or because of issues related to comfort that uh, the, the crime rates will go up. And those are sort of very petty, trivial issues compared to um, the issues that he thought about, that they should guide our political ideas. Uh, and, and that is something that is extremely valuable because he goes beyond the trivial. Um, and he sees these, uh, the political just as a part of uh, the sacred and your sacred duties. And sometimes I, I don't think he goes far enough with that because like I sort of, uh, I've hinted at that he has these sort of uh, limitations as, as a sort of a bourgeois intellectual um, in, in his sort of individualism, right? Uh, and that's probably not very useful in political context with the, the sort of the liberated, the differentiated individual. It's, it's, it's some, there's something modern about that. What's in it for me? How can I transcend? Uh, how can I reach this differentiated state of being? Uh, it's very self-centered, whereas, um, I mean, personally, I, I see myself as, I mean, I am nothing. I mean, well, it's, it's my ancestors, my duty to my ancestors, that's everything. And my duty to my descendants, that's everything. And that's the, sort of the individual, that that's the goal to, for the individual to transcend. That, that is, uh, um, those aspects are modern and that gives him a, a weird view on politics just because of this sort of eccentric nature but he has he has a lot there's a lot of useful stuff in in evola um and and there's a lot of insightful stuff uh but um but you have to sort of take take the good with the bad and you have to understand that he he you know probably wasn't a guru <laughs> you know he was he was he was an eccentric intellectual and and eccentric intellectuals they um, you know, they can come up with some brilliant stuff and, and some crazy stuff. Pat? 
um, summary. Um, I, I suppose, again, as I've made clear before, my position is not strictly an Evolian one. Um, I'm a, um, quote, authentic type of, uh, of, of, of re reactionary with um, deeply rooted traditional Catholic views on, on metaphysics. Um, the reason I'm so obsessive over Evola is that he is such a... Um, He's 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 a kind of he's a kind of bridge between the perennials and the old school re reactionaries, and he also takes us into places that reactionaries can't generally go. Um, and he answers certain very important questions that would be very difficult to ask otherwise. Um, and as I say, you know, as as um, as uh, Frodi said, it, it it's wrong to kind of just boil him down to being a, a, a political thinker. But those books he wrote at the end of his life, when he talks about the situation we find ourselves in, are some of the the best political writings of the last few hundred years. I think, um, you know, in terms of how he describes the, the situation a traditionalist finds himself in, um, in such an age, um, that's what drew me to Evola initially. Before, because I'm going to be quite frank, um, I understand what was trying to be sought after with the all the stuff on magic and kind of Eastern doctrine. And um, I, I myself have studied uh, Hinduism and, and, and Islam in various forms, but ultimately the magic stuff I just don't find useful. Um, I find it, uh, from a Christian point of view, it's heretical, of course. Um, and uh, that's kind of puts a gulf between me and traditional perennialists and Evolians. But um, I still read it because I still understand what he's trying to do. And I still, I still understand the kind of purely metaphysical goal he's trying to reach, which is an enormously valuable thing in an age in which everything is material, basically. Um, yeah, so, 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 I mean, it's quite... I mean, we're going to have to hit these Super Chats uh, in a minute, and, you know, it's, it's late on in the day. There's been a lot of Evola. One of the things that um, I've kind of noticed as people have been talking, though, is that there... I, and this is a rather difficult thing to articulate, but... As far as I can understand it, when Evola is talking about metaphysics and when he's talking about the transcendent, he is not necessarily talking about religion. And I, I no. keep on seeing a conflation between these two between these two things, but my understanding is that when Evola's talking about these things, he's not necessarily talking about religion in the way that most people would most people would imagine it and if you if you go back to that interview that he did in french the interviewer asks him about god at one point and um i think it's worth reviewing his answer to that question um because he's talking about uh something that's rather difficult to put into words but it's, it's like something beyond beyond um, I would, standard I would, religions that people would, would think I would about, describe yeah. it as a path to absolute being. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so, 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 yeah, so that, that, is, that is just something that I, I think people should conceptually rem uh, keep distinct um, when, uh, so, so like, for example, when he's drawing on Buddhism or on Hinduism or whatever, it's never about, like, uh, worshipping Shiva or something. No. It, it's, it's always just a kind of technique or path to getting to some, this other place. Um, and there's not too many writers. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I mentioned Carlyle sort of has this perspective as well. Um, uh, and in a similar way, Carlyle, like Frodi was saying, you know, it, it's almost a question before you get to policy. Like he's, he's, he's constantly having a go at uh, people in London and in parliament. He's like, Oh, the bill of this, the bill of that, this policy, that policy. Who give like? He's like, who who cares? The the problem that faces mm. us is b before all of this, yeah. um, and this is kind of Evola's perspective on a lot of things as well. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He. I think people have to sort of uh, think of something like the the Platonic world of ideas that mm -hmm. he has these sort of perfect ideas of what a state is and and the duty of the state is to resemble that. And that sort of has an absolute existence. It's, it's very platonic in that sense. 
So it's not, it's not, re and, and, and also just like uh, John Morgan pointed out that tradition, the sort of uh, uppercase um, T uh, tradition and, and lowercase T tradition are two different things that the traditionalists, they meant a very specific thing with their, their term tradition. It's, it's not what's been handed down necessarily, what's been handed down through actual history. It is uh, something that is beyond the, the the physical world. It's sort of something like a platonic idea. So th th that's what we are supposed to um, resemble or imitate or whatever. Yeah, or get pr close probably to. The, pr probably the uh, thing I'd point people to that made me appreciate this this difference between religion, i.e. the religion that most people think of, and what Evel is talking about transcendence is is a there's a very long introduction to Men Among the Ruins by Dr. H. T. Hansen. And um there's there's a bit in there where he's talking about the influence of Meister Eckhart, who is this kind of German mystic, I guess, or yes. like he's kind of a like a you know, depending on who you are, so heretical kind of Christian uh, guy you know people call him a mystic or a gnostic or something and um you know like forever it doesn't really matter what you call this guy he's getting at something true right doesn't it, it doesn't matter about the doctrines doesn't get matter about the you know the the theology behind it he's getting at something real in the same way that the buddhists are getting at something real or the practitioners of tantra yoga are getting at something real and it doesn't matter what like he's he, whatever that is that's what he's trying to reach, uh, regardless of the labels you attach to these things. Um, so, yeah, that's the, probably the probably the best uh, I can, um, you know, that's probably the the best understanding I I've come to when it comes to understanding what he really means by transcendence. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, shall we hit some super chats? Get out of here. I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's the eunuch says, in the entropy. Thank you for creating Evel a day, and thanks to Aaron, Evelyn, Furious, John Cat, Charlie, Prudentialist, Frody, and Panama Hair for adding their voices to the affair. May we all celebrate both the right-hand path and the left-hand path victories together next year. Yeah, well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Yiz. Uh, you've been with us all day, one of the one of the hardcores. Uh, Nilzo uh, Flaif says, Hail the gods, hail the folk, hail to you gentlemen and your wonderful work. Thank you very much uh, for that. It means so much. And then um, I'll go on the main super chats. And people were actually sending super chats all day, which obviously I, I wasn't able to read. So there wasn't that many of them. Um, uh, let's have a look. Uh, uh, Drongo um, says the evasive breed of man, Laraza, Delumo Sufgente, is the gamma. The last man is the boomer. Um, here's the eunuch says, just ate a strong medical THC edible for today. Got to get my spiritual en energy up forever a day. Drongo says, I ate spaghetti. Got my romantis up forever a day. Uh, be happy. has just sent me five pounds. Thank you very much, sir. Machiavelli sucks to go, says, private central banking money creation produces nothing of value. Purely a parasitical relationship. Well, quite right. Drongo says, the yes, the ban hammer prevails. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did ban seven people uh, throughout the course of the day. Um, at, an event like this is kind of uh, quite good for letting me see who shouldn't be around. So, uh, yeah, and uh, I'll review the I'll review the chat later on and uh, weed out anyone I think is not uh, not up to being here. Uh, Drongo also says ban, ban, ban. Glow in the dark says by destroying the old traditional morals, which they thought were chains, they actually became slaves to materialistic desires unable to see farther than their own belly. Slaves that are blind to it. They're very good. Um, Glow in the Dark says, I disagree. Those of higher status do have a duty, not to their neighbor, not to their countrymen, but to abstract concepts for the abstract ideal mankind. Um, one, thing I, one thing I will uh, note, Frodi, you, you did an interview a while back. Uh, I forget the guy's name now, but I think you were talking about Men Among the Ruins. Mm, Alexander um, Jacob. Mm. Yeah, and and I mean, with, with respect to the guy, there were many aspects of Evola that I thought he, he he kind of got wrong there, 
And I think one of the things that he was continually getting wrong, if you, if you don't mind me saying, was that uh, was actually the point that you were that you were pointing towards, um, which is that Evelo is extremely individualist and has mm -hmm. almost no sense of the collective, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whereas this uh, this guest of yours kept on reading that sense of like um, almost more like kind of uh, classic third positionist collectivism. He was kind yeah. of like reading that back into Evelo where it's just not there. So I think that people should be careful of making that move because I think you're right to say that he's a very radical individualist all the way through his career and never never really makes these concessions to um, to to collectivism really uh, unless I'm mistaken. I think so. I think I think you're right about that, and I think that people should should be aware of it. And and that's also why uh, you know when when you hear people say that or mainstream or politically correct people say that Evola was a fascist you you're not just being you know clever by saying he's not he was actually not i mean he didn't fit into the fascist party uh, there were sort of huge conflicts between him and the fascist party and between him and the national and national socialism one of the things he said is that the idea is our fatherland so he was this sort of uh, idealist philosopher he wasn't um loyal to the to the, the people or to the race or anything like that the nation and and like i said his sort of identity as an eccentric intellectual led him to have some sympathies even for Kalergi, right so so it's you have to be careful about just placing him uh, in some sort of uh, um camp political camp because he was very much like a, a, a sort of an eccentric purity spiraler uh, yeah. with his I, own ideals. Uh, and so that made him, like so many artistic into, uh, or art, artists and intellectuals and eccentrics, they don't really fit into the political scheme at all. And, and I mean, th those people would, would be sort of handicapped on the political scene. I mean, yeah, you want to I mean, be a political person without a mass movement? That's, uh, that's crazy talk. <laughs> you know? so, so people have to be aware of those things. Yeah, one of the things I will say is that the closest he would get to anything, I mean, it's not collectivism, but the closest he would get to it would be saying that, you know, in the in the kind of ideal state where you have the, you know, the divine ruler or whatever, there would mm -hmm. be an essential unity between the different castes um, so that, um, you know, a, a genuine um, lord-vassal relationship, let's just say, um, is organic and it's uh and it's unified you don't have this marxist class struggle um when when you have genuine authority and when he talks about genuine authority what he means is you want to serve this person from your own from your own volition you want mm. to serve them because they you know they have something about them you know as this uh as this kind of great king or whatever um mm. And I, I think, as far as I understand fascist doctrine, that aspect of it, where you have a kind of vertical integration and unity rather than struggle between the between the classes, that's probably the closest point of affinity, I would say, between classic fascism and Evola's view of things. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, uh, but but there's always there's always the the question of how how to get there right and and if you're always critical of everyone who does anything practical in the world you're never going to get there so that's why it's 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 sort of it, and that's the problem in general with idealism and communism is also a form of idealism that uh, <laughs> that they have this this idea this this fantasy about what things uh, could be and they don't really care about how to get there. And, and that's what sort of it's, is the problem from a political point of view, because political is, politics is practical. But what he does uh, that, that, that I think is the most valuable, his most valuable contribution, I can just read one final quote, is that he says that there is only one way out of the crisis of the Western world. And this is in pagan imperialism. There's only one way out of the crisis of the Western world through a restoration of the absolute synthesis of the two powers, political and sacred, 
royal and spiritual uh, on the basis of an Aryan pagan vision of the world and uh, of the, uh, let me see, I've lost it here, a nucleation of higher forms of benefit life and individuality, uh, a new universality. But this point that he says that the, the synthesis of the political and the sacred, that it, to get away from the crushing nihilism and pettiness and trivial triviality of the modern world, you have to get some higher values back into politics because otherwise it's pointless. It's pointless to talk just about the everyday trivial issues of a little bit of taxes here and a little bit of taxes there, crime rates up or down, and all these petty issues while the, the overarching problem is that we've lost all sense of meaning. And that's what he focuses in on. And that's, that's his valuable contribution. Yeah, and I, I actually was, I mean, it seems... Uh ridiculous now but i remember making a video late last year do you remember when the whole craziness was going on in the middle of the election and there was that guy uh lynn wood and sydney powell do you remember all those characters um i thought there was a moment there for like a week or two when it felt like there was a higher value in politics briefly um now it could be that lynn wood was a grifter right and there's all these people were grifters but they seemed to be tapping into there was a they were hitting a register that I hadn't seen before in real American politics or in politics period in my lifetime, where it almost took on a spiritual, uh, religious, uh, good versus evil dimension. Um, mm -hmm. I, unfortunately, it was, you know, crushed by uh, or, you know, we, we don't need to go into all of that. But it was just the first time I'd seen even the hint of it uh, anywhere, you know. Um, Anyway, Glow in the Dark says Tony Blair is that is is like a wife that slowly poisons, poisoning her husband through his food, as it builds in his body. He gets weaker and weaker. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okie dokie says somebody needs to have a word with Keith Woods about po posting non Evola related content on Evola Day. Uh, did he? I, Keith did say he was going to try to get something up, but um, maybe maybe he didn't manage it. Um, I don't know. I've I've kind of been kind of watching stuff all day plus trying to do other things uh, so i haven't been able to have a look to see uh what else has been going on on youtube today um drongo has just uh, posted another ban hammer uh francisco garcia says i nominate philosophy cat philosopher cat to be our youtube berg mother just finished the ura linda asha logos edition words of the true friar um so there we go uh Alex Dunham says, evolution. Uh, if you read Edgar Rice Burroughs in particular, his history of the Hyborian, Hyperborean age. Um, yeah, I haven't read Edgar Rice uh, Burroughs. And, I mean, I don't know what to make of all of that Hyperborean stuff in Synthesis, the Doctrine of Race, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, it's kind of interesting to read about, but, I mean, I have no idea uh, about the veracity of any of it. Uh, Cringe Walker says Native Americans have their own versions of Jack and the Beanstalk and Cinderella, suggesting that these stories are well over 10,000 years old. Uh, yeah, I mean, th that is something else that, that Evelyn and Gunon do quite a lot, um, which is they see like the same, they spot the same stories in many different traditions, right? Um, or, or extremely similar stories, uh, and which then suggests that they're getting at something something real um dan howard says when are you going to have the juminati on uh i mean what uh super master juice says, has just posted a poo okay uh glow in the dark um says drugs are used to get rid of that desire for transcendence with a high that if they ever had to get rid of the drugs they would hate their life yeah, I, I can't remember where he talks about this, but um, I, I'm pretty sure he talks about taking drugs as a, like a kind of false, it's like a like a transcendence downwards, or a, like a false. It's like an escape, I think he calls it, which is not true. Which is not true transcendence. Cow says, "Unblock me at once, John D." Uh, good luck. Uh, Armory Blaine says, "Thoughts on the panel on James Gregor's work on the intellectual history of Italian fascis fascism, if familiar." Must read, but unfairly harsh on Evola. Uh, any of you guys read James Gregor on on Italian fascism? I I have not. 
closer I have. Many and many years ago now, but <laughs> but yeah, I, I I hardly remember. It's probably like twenty years ago. It's, it's one of the old um, uh, old sort of uh, historians of fascism. I mean, I, I, I go as far as to say there's very there's very little kind of main mainstream scholarship written since 1945 that I would have any tr truck with anymore, to be honest. Uh, just, just, it's too, um, how can I say, uh, there's, th if I detect a boomer truth, I, I immediately become distrustful of the, of the source that I'm reading. Um, which is yeah, the uh, henchmen which, of evil and all, you know, those kinds of things in the title. That's like, okay, well, yeah, which is not to say that I mean, um, there's there's this guy called Paul Furlong who wrote a who wrote a pretty mainstream study on Evola uh, for Routledge, which I have. Um, it's called uh, the Social and Political Thought of Julius Evola, and that's a very fair, even-handed, academic, scholarly study. So I'm not saying that it's impossible for scholars to produce good work. Um, you know, any of my books, for example, were produced within the academy uh so far um but i i'm it it is it is it's a rarity though there, there's a lot of there's a lot of um straightforward ideological or just bad work done um to, to the point where it, it's becoming like a couple of weeks back uh, i don't know if you saw the cigar stream that we tried to do on mcworld jihad versus mcworld and that like all we, we just couldn't get over the deeply embedded like progressive uh uh kind of assumptions behind every sentence almost you know it is the, this is the sort of thing i'm talking about um yeah and, and as i become more aware i be, just become more and more i just i see it everywhere you know um mm. there's, this there's is why this, i would say uh, read books no, written ahead. before 1945 no carry on for a <laughs> sorry yeah no i mean there, there is this uh populist um sort of anti-immigration, that's sort of what I was trying to get at as well, that there is, um, in, in populism in Europe, there is this sentiment that, uh, you know, the, the problem with the Muslims is that they object to gay pride parades or things like that, right? That, that, mm -hmm. that, that liberalism is, is the default position and, and everyone is supposed to fit into that. And, and that's that's a non-starter, of course. Uh, anyone who follows my work, <laughs> watching this, uh, knows that. But I think that is really what we have to get at: that we have to go to the fundamental first principles, the fundamental issues, and get away from just the superficial, trivial stuff. Yeah, no, that, absolutely. I, I've come to see um, I've come to see liberalism as more of a mind virus almost than socialism. At least you can occasionally get an honest socialist academic, you know. I mean, I just, I honestly just think there's there's some there's a there, there's an issue uh, in the liberal mindset that that renders it blind to do to too many things. Um, where where sometimes um, I find that the far left can actually sense something, right? I mean, whether they can articulate it or not, they can sense where the danger points are, whereas the Whereas the liberal is just a just like an intolerant, closed-minded. I hate to use the word, but like bigot. You know, like the true bigots are the are are, are, are the liberals because yeah, they just the, have the such a narrow have... purview on the world. Yeah, the communists have some instincts left. So, yeah. Any any views on that hat? Do you agree? <clears throat> you still um, at, the, at the risk of sounding reductive, basically, yes. <laughs> um, I've been listening. I've been listening quite intently to it. Um, I would say, on the point of liberalism, I mean, to me, liberalism is a disease that has to infect everybody else so that it looks healthy. You know, like that—that's why it's had to colonize the entire world because you can't have like an entire world of liberalist, gay pride, immigrant hellholes, and then one like trad, uh, racially homogenous, you know burgeoning state like this is this this is this is um my theory as to why they were so keen to get rid of south africa and rhodesia um mm. because you simply yeah. could not have even i mean e even though those were technically in the tradition of liberalism with the uh, parliaments and presidents and prime ministers and everything you know they were just Ian Smith, they, they the classical liberal <laughs> exactly they were they were yeah. they were just too um too 
uh, I suppose, acting in their own self-interest, not not the interest of the global liberal order. It's you, very you totalitarian. You're not allowed, yeah, you're oh, not allowed to have examples of of anything else, right? No. I mean, why why do they have to have? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how how far I can go. We're on YouTube, but but why do they have to have, for example, mass immigration in tiny little towns on the countryside that that don't matter? Well, because you can't. This sort of the urban modern life experience has to be everywhere. There cannot be. Uh, an exception anywhere because they're afraid of the domino effect. What if people exactly. see this and like it better than what we have, <laughs> right? So, so they have to they have to just force everyone into the same mold, and it, it's it's a very sort of totalitarian worldview. Yes, yeah, I know absolutely, and they they they're very good at lasering in on the exception and uh, snuffing out like the the little. Um, that was that was almost the most insidious part of that um, Jahan versus McWill book. The, you know, the fact he was pointing out, oh, we can't leave this little little kind of rural outlet over there because it's a it's a form of jihad, you know, yeah. in its own parochial way. Um, so this is why you end up, you know, with literally Somalis in bloody Wales now. You know, uh, anyway, um, Winter Phoenix uh, Forest uh, Corinne says. Hey, AA, there are two really cool works on medieval economics written by Japanese scholars. They're called Mayu Mao Yusha and Okami to Oshin Ryu, but they have English translations. Read them. Yeah, I might I might um, have a look at those when I come to look at guilds. That's on my to-do list. It might not be for a couple of months, but I want to look at, at the guild system at some point. Um, Quinge Walker says OG plan trusting. I think he was talking about Evola trusting that plan that Panama Hat mentioned the South, the South Italy plan. Um, Cringe Walker well, says, South Italy plan. Do you remember when you said like he 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 went to he fled to Southern Italy or something at one point? Ev maybe, Evola. maybe, yeah. No, he he <clears throat> he was in Rome right after the um, the coup took place, um, but he was convinced there was about to be a massive counter coup. To over to get the um, this new government out of power and restore Mussolini, um, but it never materialized. Uh, Cringe Walker says, "My feeling when Himmler cast magic missile." <laughs> um, I, I mean, I do find it mad that they. I mean, if it, from a certain point of view, they wanted to revive a t Teutonic medieval order, and they had a castle. I mean, it's kind of like, from a certain point of view, like wild. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Machiavelli sucks to go says we well, really should study the philosophy of Henry Ford uh, I'm not sure how much philosophy Ford had to be honest uh, beyond certain right beyond you know beyond that one publication that I know that you have in mind but I'm not sure how much, like, independent. I, I, I'm not sure how much actual philosophy is in there it's, it's more a kind of historical document of what was going on uh, at that time that I encourage people to have a look at um, uh, and he didn't know, write it, <laughs> and and he didn't write it. Was it was put together by the editors of it, right? Uh, yeah. So, 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 yeah. Uh, Hector Evola says, "I hate my dad." Very <laughs> <laughs> super. Hector. Yeah. Uh, you, you've unearthed him. Huh? There we go. Uh, we've we've brought him forward. Um, Glow in the dark says, "For those that reject a tradition, even if there is nothing wrong with it, because you don't like it or want something different." Are selfish. They would uproot the rest of society on mere whims of the moment. Um, yeah, uh, true. Although, although, as I've been stressing all day, um, you have to differentiate when you're talking about Evola between the capital T tradition, which is a kind of ideal, may never be reached, uh, and uh, specific it, specific traditions, kind of small T tradition manifested in locales, which. Um, you know, could, in Evola's view, are neither here nor there, or they could neither be here nor there. Um, you know, like the like, like the tradition of Halloween, for example. Um, uh, Ruvik BL says, "All day, gang. Thank you for Evola Day. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ruvik, uh, for your hundred snacks." 
Glow in the Dark says, uh, liberal mindset reminds me of how they use to characterize other ideologies. The other ideologies are closed-minded unless you become one of them. Religions are closed-minded. They won't allow other beliefs. Basic Trotsky tactics. Yeah, I mean, I, I genuinely believe that the, the liberal mindset is the, is the most is the most closed off, the most um, unable to entertain other ideas. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's why when you when you find thinkers who are able to see outside of that, it's worth holding on to them. I mean, Evel is one of them. Uh, Carl's another one. I, the, there's a. I always mention that book, Albion Seed, by David Hackett Fisher. One of the reasons that's such a good book is because he does not try to explain away what the original settlers in America were doing through materialist lens. When they say they were on a divine mission, he believes them. Um, mm. And I, I think this is a this is something that historians should do more is mm. basically like believe the people when they say stuff, um, which, which is not to say like, OK, you have to believe all propaganda. But you'll probably like get a better understanding of what somebody was up to if you sometimes take them at their word. I don't. I even yeah. include the mid-century Germans in that. Even them. Um, yeah, this idea the... that they were—it's always propaganda. They're always lying. It's always realpolitik. It gets you into this. It gets you into this um, mindset that the only driver of history is uh, is material, and that's like a Marxist view of history. So. Yeah, and it's taken for granted. It sort of begs the question, right? So, so uh, for example, Walter Otto was uh, basically the first uh, modern religious scholar who uh, took the view that that people believed the the gods were real. You know, it, it wasn't just uh, uh, sociological reasons or uh, psychological reasons or economic reasons. No, they actually believed the gods were real. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, yeah. It's uh, it, it's very sort of everything has become extremely ideological uh, with interpreting history today. Hello. <clears throat> hey, hey. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Um I, w I was just saying that my the second part of my response to Adam and uh, Sitch uh, last week or the week before, whenever it was, was called on the liberal need to psychologize. Now, even if you had no interest in the saga that led to it, I'd recommend people go and watch that because I think that's one of the nodes of subversion that people do almost without thinking that um, really prevents uh, somebody with a liberal mindset from believing in anything. You know, I, t I talk about Daria, the Gen X Daria, the kind of nihilistic uh, uh, individual who's not able to have any authentic feeling. If you if you actually go and watch Daria, she's constantly psychoanalyzing everybody around her. You know, she's always coming up with these kind of ad hoc reasons, the real reason behind somebody doing this or that. You know, she even does it to herself. And um, I think I think that's a terrible tendency. Uh, people do almost without thinking about it these days so yeah i i, I hate the amateur psychoanalysis um i know it sounds weird uh it, 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 i've come to despise tim burton movies for this reason um <laughs> did you ever watch the the remake of willy wonka the, the charlie and the chocolate no, factory <laughs> there, there's a there's, there's a terrible moment in it where um where we're told that uh the reason that Willy Wonka is the way he is is because his uh, his father was an evil dentist, played by Christopher Lee. And it's like, oh, you've just... You're not sapped, allowed to have any mystery. Yeah, you've sapped the enigma and the mystery and all the charm out of this character, Willy Wonka. Um, you know, he does the same thing in the in the Batman movies, actually. You know, now, now the Penguin is not some, like, you know, eccentric uh, kind of, uh, you know, socialite wannabe he's a he's a freak whose parents have thrown him down the river and you know that this is why he's a villain you know i i, yeah. I just i hate the psychoanalysis i really I, I, I agree and it it really crept in post world war ii um you know everything became in fact one of the biggest bugbears of reactionaries post-war has been 
psychoanalysis and Freudianism because it gives people an excuse for bourgeois um, modes of, of acting. You know, if it's your, you know, your compulsion to take drugs or overeat or or binge drink is all is all chalked up to you know childhood traumas. It's not your fault. It's somebody else's fault. Uh, the reason that you're depressed all the time is not is not because you're a you know a, a, a wastrel with with no purpose. No, it's because you're you know it's your your horrible upbringing where your parents didn't give you a teddy bear or something. You know, it, it's like it just these these ways of of explaining things away. Yeah, one of the I mean, while we're on this, I do, I know we want to want to wrap up in a minute, but um. One of the things that really interested me about the the thinkers of this era, uh, Evola is one of them, uh, Yoki is another one, um, th various others, is that they, they pinpoint th three nodes of subversion, right? They, um, obviously, one of them is Marxism, right? Uh, Freudianism is the second strand. The third strand is is actually evolution, e Darwinism. Um Evola saw this as a problem. Yoki saw it as a problem. And various other thinkers of the right saw this as an issue then. And um, I find that super duper interesting because now Darwinism and evolutionary theory has become the domain of the right. And I, I, I find that, I find that uh, fascinating. And I don't know how to resolve it or um, whether evolutionary theory actually is a node of subversion without even realizing it. Because um, well, evolution the, has a kind of logic, you know, has a progressive logic. Yeah, the, I actually, that's one of my notes for, for this show today. I just didn't get to it yet. But but that's one of the things that uh, Evola and Yoki, just like you said, and also Nietzsche have in common that they sort of reject uh, the theory of evolution on, on these uh, sort of weird grounds. And, and the mistake that they're making uh, in sort of misunderstanding evolution is that they see it as a normative theory. So they they sort of um, conflate it with the the idea, the sort of leftist idea of progress. Mm -hmm. but but the theory of evolution through natural selection has is is not normative at all. It, it doesn't say that things get better. It just says that you know through mutations and and different uh, evolutionary pressures, we will, adapt to different uh, different environments and that we're related <laughs> you know with yeah, other I, organisms I, but it's yeah. it's it's sort of weird that because they see it as oh this is a part of the idea of progress and of course uh, evola took the view that we didn't you know start in a dark past and and now we're going up and it's sort of uh, uh, it, we're ascending and it's becoming better and better and the next generation is going to be happier than the previous one he sees it as we have descended we have fallen from previous glory in uh in the past and and things just are just getting worse so he just he was so uh, i think that they were sort of um so wedded to the idea of degeneration that they thought that well this must be another part of the idea of progress that evolution is a part of that but of course it's not normative at all i i do think that um there is so let me just draw a distinction a second between evolution as the actual scientific uh, theory and evolutionism if, if you allow me to do that or darwinism um as applied like so for example herbert spencer in his sociological theories had did have a kind of normative theory of moral pro moral and social progress like the civil that there's this kind of civilizing force um, I have a I have a book here by Matt Ridley called The Evolution of Everything, um, which which is you know it, it's kind of the Whig the Whig version of history, right? Um, and I, I think that this is really what they've got in mind. Uh, you know whether they are, whether they articulate it or not, they they perceive that Darwinism, um, get, like whether it's a correct scientific theory or not. It gave people a kind of normative shape to yeah. to history and that in that and and to um, and to society. Um, you know, like Herbert Spencer, for example, saw um, he had this idea that uh, as civilizations got more and more civilized, they became less and less violent. For example, like I mean, and that, and you can see that right right up until 
that book that Steven Pinker wrote a couple of years back, um, Better Angel of Our Nature, was all about how we're less violent now. Um, so, and it's not only the yeah. critics of uh, evolution that are guilty of this. Also, you know, people like uh, Richard Dawkins and others, they're, they, they are sort of mislead or they're sloppy with their language. They're sloppy with their terminology about this issue so that they, they make it sound as if it is normative. And so, of course, they're, they're, you know, it, if it is described as normative, then it's, it's wrong because it isn't. It's not supposed to be normative. <laughs> it's, it's a mechanic uh, uh, process, right? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think, though, that it's any, it's any coincidence that the, the so-called four horsemen of new atheism were hardcore evolution guys as well. Yeah. Uh, or that Steven Pinker is a hardcore evolution guy. Um, well, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With some limitations, though. I mean, that's that's the thing. Uh, when it comes to uh, human beings, they become creationists, essentially. Um, so th that's that's the problem. That's what you know. People like J. Philip Rushton have criticized them for that. Yeah, you, you say that you believe in the theory of evolution, but when it comes to humans, then all of a sudden, the last ten thousand years or twenty thousand years, it's just been creationism. Magically, we're all the same, right? And so this is, they don't really take it to any logical conclusion. Therius Luminous says, we should protect our people and culture, um, but mass movements do not stand a chance against those who wield power in the idea space. That is why the progressives rule the world. Um, yeah, I mean, when I finally finish my uh, Foundations of Politics course, uh, which is all going to be about elite theory, um, I do think that the the mass movement um is uh or, or the popular movement is something that um pre people on the right are probably gonna have to get beyond um because it's just not how power functions um and there's been i mean that ca bond book was was good on this people have been reading de juvenile um i want to i want to get people reading mosca and pareto as well and and robert mcgall's to understand that the uh, in order to get anywhere in actual politics, um, you need a concerted, organized, tight-knit, small group. Uh, I think Mos Mosca says somewhere, uh, you need a hundred, the hundred will always prevail against the thousand, right? Because it's easier for the hundred to organize. Um, but w we're up against a huge issue um, whereby the... The current elites are extremely smart on this particular matter, um, so so that uh, if you did if you ever did start to organise, uh, you, you know you'd probably just be sitting next to an FBI agent because they're they're very they're very good on snuffing out actual threats to their power. Um, this is stuff to talk about for another day. Um, Sirius Luminous says, "AA, your thinking has gotten closer to Dugin's. He thinks liberalism is the main problem." Ever thought of getting Michael Millerman on stream? Uh, I'm aware of Michael Millerman. In fact, I think he did put something out, uh, hashtagging Evola Day, which is probably the first uh, indirect communication I've had with him. Um, I've always, uh, I haven't really got in touch with him much because he's selling courses. And of course, I sell courses. And I, you know, I'm Vince McMahon. I don't want to give WCW uh, action. I, I, you have to act like they don't exist. Um, but maybe I'll maybe I'll get in touch with him and uh, you know see if we can make a deal or something. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know much about. Uh, I've I've watched a few like Dugan interviews and things. I don't really. The, the trouble with him is that he's very Russian, and I I don't know if his thinking, from what I can see, would be relevant to anyone who's not Russian. I mean, Frody, have you read much Dugan? Or... He seems to be Russian centric yeah, I, to me and. I, Exactly, uh, and not just Russian in um, in the way of you know seeing politics from a Russian perspective, but the entire style of of interacting with with intellectual issues or theoretical issues is very Russian. <laughs> I mean, he's sort of an occultist, a mystic. Uh, the the sort of the Anglo or Western style of philosophy is 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 not really. We're not used to dealing with that way of thinking let's just say that without being uh normative one way or the other saying that one thing is better than the other but uh yeah i'm i'm not really you know uh, 
it's it's too much of a sort of um, a, a mystical style. Uh, but you know, it has its place, but not really. Uh, it's not really a part of what I'm doing. Um, have you already read any Dugan or watched any Dugan? Um, I can't say that outside of um, Curse already knowing about him and some of his works. No, I I do have a copy of um, uh, the fourth political theory, but I've not read it yet. Glow in the Dark says, the sweet ideology of it's not your fault, it's other people's fault, and you can't solve it without external validation or the experts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I genuinely think that the therapy culture, um, you know, the it's it's one of those really insidious parts of modern culture that uh, it's quite difficult to resist. It's really deeply embedded. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, and it's a hit. It, the thing is, it's a hidden one. So it's, you know, somebody may be uh, quote unquote based in all sorts of ways, but then as soon as you get to that, that you know, suddenly they default to like, oh yeah, you know, I. I got this condition. I got that condition, and they become very defensive over it as well. So, yeah, um, I don't know what to do about that. Um, Machiavelli uh, sucks to go. Says the elites have to get their supporters to sell their souls. Um, and yeah, I mean my my view on the <clears throat> on the current situation is that there's no uh, when Evola says uh, there's no negotiating with subversion. You could adopt that. I, th- I don't think there's any negotiating with the current elites. It's either total overthrow or collapse or something. There's no, there's no getting anywhere with it, with it, with the current lot. Um, you could get some who defect, maybe like some rogues, right? Um, but uh, even that would be fraught with peril, I would say, for, for, for any of us. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think um, people were talking about this. Recently, when there was that whole drama between C.A. Bond and uh, Bronze Age Pervert and so on, I seem to remember listening to a, a conversation about, like, should you accept money from some, like, rogue billionaire or something? Um, and, uh, I mean, ultimately, um, that will be necessary, but uh, it, it, it's fraught with peril because uh, at the moment there are basically no friends that I can see in the elites whatsoever, you know, from the, the Pope and the Queen to... You know your local library, basically. There's just no, there's just nobody, unless I've missed something. Anyone disagree? Do you do you agree with that, Frodo? There, there are no friends in the elites at all. They're all pure enemy on the on on the Schmidt. Yeah, front. I, don't, I don't think we have any friends in the elites. Uh, I think that I think that you know people in all parts of society um, follow our kind of things uh, and especially the sort of the the sort of more intellectual stuff that i guess we're all of us here are sort of aiming at a more intellectual audience right uh and of course some of those people will be in higher positions in society i don't believe that the kind of people who um go to the world economic forum meetings or or other kinds of meetings for these elites i don't think that any of them are sympathetic with our point of view i think that the whole point with that is that they are the super rich they will tend to have a completely different experience of life Uh, and so they they meet up with each other and talk about how to realize uh, their own vision of how the world is supposed to be and they have no sympathy for for our point of view, um, you know, thinking that this is we're in the, a total state of collapse. Some people are actually so separate, so far separated from society, uh, meaning the elites uh, that are so separated from society that they actually think that things are getting better. Yeah, and, um, I should mention. I mean, uh, I mentioned the elite theorists. That idea of like the hundred as against the thousand. One one part of it. Um, you know, I, I call it Mosca's law. He says the, the the smaller the minority and the bigger the populace, the harder it is for the for the majority to organize as against the minority, right? Um, and at the moment, the the elites, as we call them, the super elites, the actual ruling class, are tiny. I mean, who are they even? The Davos man, right? The, the we're talking about a tiny percentage of the population against huge swathes of people. We're not just talking about like America 
We're talking about all of Europe, or like all of the, you know, all of Japan, all of the, like we're talking more plebs against fewer elites than like ever in history, to mm. an extent where like how would would we even organize against them? This and this is this is the this is the difficult thing about the, um, the current the current system, um, because uh, it's so all per se, it's it's global and it's so all pervasive, um. So, like, we've all recognized what the problem is, but actually, how do you organize against that? Because it's not, it's not like Fidel Castro um, organizing against Havana anymore. We're in a completely different world now. Um, oh, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that will require some, like, next-level thinking. Uh, um, it almost needs to be, like, um, you know, Fidel Castro uh, does Havana times 40 all at once how you did how you how that happens i i have no idea that would require and also, a level of, of coordination uh across borders that has never been seen before in history and and the 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 right also has a purely negative identity i mean the the only thing that unifies the right is that we know what we don't like we don't like mm -hmm. the current development but other than that there's nothing there's no vision yeah, so maybe, maybe Evelo, I mean, to come back uh, to finish things off, maybe the Evelo is right. Just got to ride the tiger until it all collapses. <laughs> yeah. I would, yeah, say, I would yeah. say, don't ever give up hope, as slim as it may be, that one of the uh, elites, as they grow more powerful, may turn out to be a sort of Constantine, the, 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 the great figure. You know, don't never, never quite give up that possibility, I think. That there, there could always be one who is powerful enough and just has a moment where they suddenly realize, you know, they're like, if it's possible for one of us to become red pill, then it's possible for one of them to become red pilled. I think, I mean, it's rare yeah. and there's, I'm not saying it would work, but you know, remember that Constantine, the, the, the great was a real man who really did convert the empire to Christianity. So, you know, it can once I get, once I get cringe Walker into the Tony Blair Institute there, there's our man right there. <laughs> <laughs> <He'll tune. laughs> <laughs> that would be. I'd love to see him working with Tony Blair. Well, he is, I think he is going for it. So, let's uh, fingers crossed to give one <laughs> get one subversive in place. All right. Well, th Panama Hat. Thank you very much. You did sterling work, Frodi. No worries. Grateful as ever for you uh, coming on. Um, thank you. Just before, uh, do either of you anything have anything you'd like to promote? Uh, tell the audience about before we all go to bed. Absolutely not. <laughs> well. Uh, <Frodi. laughs> Uh, I just want to thank you so much for having me on. This has been a great day. Uh, if people want to follow me, my website is guidingthestorm.com. I have a podcast for subscribers, so you can sign up there, or you can find my videos on Odyssey at GTK for Guide to Culture. So, And also, I'm on Telegram. That's probably the best place to follow me, Guide to Culture. K-U-L-C-H-U-R, Guide to Culture. Happy Evelyn Day, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I can see people who've been there since 2 p.m. There are some like hardcore, <laughs> loyal, loyal, hardcore. That's, that's that's almost 12 hours of Evola. Yeah, I mean, this is you know, Evola Day is Evola Day. Um, oh, you've got, you've got another massive super chat. Someone just oh, said right, 500. Um, yeah, Drongo for 500 snacks. I have no idea how much money that is. <laughs> Says, <laughs> I've had this on. Is that like Scandinavian money, right? I think so. Probably like oh yeah, five hundred. Yeah. That's uh, uh, about fifty euro. Okay. All right. Well, thank. You. Yeah, super chat of the day, Drongo. <laughs> he says, "I've had this on in the background all day. It was excellent through and through, despite the weak Banham account. I mean, seven's quite strong. Uh, I think you can absorb some Banhammer energy from Frodi, who made some superb KY logbooks about different lame sections of the right. Yeah. I mean, I I, I enjoy watching the uh, the your is it called the uh, Kali Yuga? That uh, yeah, the Kali Yuga logbook. Yeah, I enjoy I enjoy watching that. You're usually you're usually in some like gorgeous forest or something, uh, you know, giving <laughs> us some wisdom. I, I enjoy those. Um, uh, yes, um, just in terms of uh, myself, I'll be back tomorrow with D talking about somebody quite different, Andy Warhol. Um, although seeing Avila as kind of eccentric individualist. Maybe there's some weird crossover between Warhol and Evola. I mean, they were both artists, I guess. Um, 
but we... uh, yeah we'll be back hopefully we'll be finishing up Andy Warhol uh, tomorrow but uh knowing uh knowing D probably there'll be another part in it because we have been uh snailing our way through uh Warhol's uh, career and life um and uh then on Friday um we are discussing Carl Schmidt on the Scar stream and I've got Endeavor on and for the first time ever the aforementioned uh, Greg Johnson will be coming on, which should be interesting. I, I've never, uh, well, I've only ever talked to him once, and it was in rather embarrassing circumstances on an Andy War Warski stream in 2017, <laughs> where I wasn't even informed that this was going to happen. And he was like hitting me with all these, like, you know, you've got to ban porn, and we got to, he was hitting me with all of these kind of, uh, things and I, I didn't I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea who even was. Um <laughs> so yeah that was not that was not the best introduction between the two of us. So hopefully this will be better. We're gonna be discussing um the um Carl Schmidt on the problem with parliaments. Problem with Parliament. So uh, yes. to it. and uh yeah one more one more late super chat has come in which I should read before we, we go. Um yeah if people like this uh Evela Day we have given some thought to doing Carlisle Day on December the 4th, which is the day he was born. Yeah. Um, uh, Carlisle in some ways less hard going than Evola, I would say, and more like fun, I guess. Definitely more spicy. Although Evola can get very spicy. We just haven't talked about those things today. Um, we do have to be careful. Yeah, indeed. Um, uh, Bob Hong Kong says, Hey, Marley, I love AA. If you need Italian translated, I'm here. Oh, well, thank you very much, Bob Hong Kong. Maybe you can translate my Evola bibliography that I've got coming through the post. It still hasn't arrived. Uh, hopefully it does. Um, yes. Uh, also, um, oh, and the, this one has come through as well. Logos Ek Machina says, come listen to my narration of Nav Revolt Against the Modern World on Logos X Machina Archive. Don't listen to AA. If you don't start at the deep end, you'll never learn to swim. Yeah, some um, some disagreement over whether to dive straight in with Revolt or do you know other readings as I as I suggested. Um, also, I should mention I do have the sale going on at the Academic Agency at the moment. Autumn twenty five gets twenty five percent off uh, all courses apart from Foundations of Research, which is probably the one you need. Um, and do buy those courses because I did my taxes yesterday and I'm still reeling from it. Still reeling, just can't. This is this. If anything's going to bring back like the libertarian in me, it will be doing doing taxes. I tell you. <laughs> oh. All right. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Now get out. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye, bye.